Ambassador Morgenthau's story by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: The Turks attempt to treat alien enemies decently, but the Germans insist on persecuting them. Soon after the bombardment of Edessa, I was closeted with Enver, discussing the subject which was then uppermost in the minds of all the foreigners in Turkey. How would the government treat its resident enemies? Would it intern them, establish concentration camps, pursue them with German malignity, and perhaps apply the favorite Turkish measure with Christians, torture and massacre? Thousands of enemy subjects were then living in the Ottoman Empire. Many of them had spent their whole lives there. Others had even been born on Ottoman soil. All these people, when Turkey entered the war, had every reason to expect the harshest kind of treatment. It is no exaggeration to say that most of them lived in constant fear of murder. The Dardanelles had been closed, so that there was little chance that outside help could reach these aliens. The capitulatory rights, under which they had lived for centuries, had been abrogated. There was really nothing between the foreign residents and destruction except the American flag. The state of war had now made me, as American ambassador, the protector of all British, French, Serbian, and Belgian subjects. I realized from the beginning that my task would be a difficult one. On one hand were the Germans, urging their well-known ideas of repression and brutality, while on the other were the Turks, with their traditional hatred of Christians, and their natural instinct to maltreat those who are helplessly placed in their power. Yet I had certain strong arguments on my side, and I now had called upon Enver for the purpose of laying them before him. Turkey desired the good opinion of the United States, and hoped, after the war, to find support among American financiers. At that time all the embassies in Constantinople took it for granted that the United States would be the peacemaker. If Turkey expected us to be her friend, I now told Enver, she would have to treat enemy foreigners in a civilized way. "'You hope to be reinstated as a world power,' I said. "'You must remember that the civilized world will carefully watch you. Your future status will depend on how you conduct yourself in war.' The ruling classes among the Turks, including Enver, realized that the outside world regarded them as people who had no respect for the sacredness of human life, or the finer emotions, and they keenly resented this attitude. I now reminded Enver that Turkey had a splendid opportunity to disprove all these criticisms. The world may say you are barbarians, I argued. Show by the way you treat these alien enemies that you are not. Only in this way can you be freed permanently from the ignominy of the capitulations. Prove that you are worthy of being emancipated from foreign tutelage. Be civilized. Be modern. In view of what was happening in Belgium and northern France at that moment, my use of the word modern was a little unfortunate. Enver quickly saw the point. Up to this time he had maintained his usual attitude of erect and dignified composure, and his face, as always, had been attentive, imperturbable, almost expressionless. Now in a flash his whole bearing changed. His countenance broke into a cynical smile. He leaned over, brought his fist down on the table, and said, "'Modern! No!' However Turkey shall wage war, at least we shall not be modern. That is the most barbaric system of all. We shall simply try to be decent. Naturally I construed this as a promise. I understood the changeableness of the Turkish character well enough. However, to know that, more than a promise was necessary. The Germans were constantly prodding the Turkish officials— persuading them to adopt the favorite German plan against enemy aliens. Germany has revived many of the principles of ancient and medieval warfare, one of her most barbaric resurrections from the past being this practice of keeping certain representatives of the population 
preferably people of distinction and influence, as hostages for the good behavior of others. At this moment the German military staff was urging the Turks to keep foreign residents for this purpose. Just as the Germans held non-combatants in Belgium as security for the friendliness of the Belgians, and placed Belgian women and children at the head of their advancing armies, so the Germans in Turkey were now planning to use French and British residents as part of their protective system against the Allied fleet. That this sinister influence was constantly at work I well knew. Therefore it was necessary that I should meet it immediately, and, if possible, gain the upper hand at the very start. I decided that the departure of the Entente diplomats and residents from Constantinople would really put to the test my ability to protect the foreign residents. If all the French and English who really wished to leave could safely get out of Turkey, I believed that this demonstration would have a restraining influence, not only upon the Germans, but upon the underlings of the Turkish official world. As soon as I arrived at the railroad station, the day following the break, I saw that my task was to be a difficult one. I had arranged with the Turkish authorities for two trains, one for the English and French residents, which was to leave at seven o'clock, and one for the diplomats and their staff, which was to go at nine. But the arrangement was not working according to schedule. The station was a surging mass of excited and frightened people. The police were there in full force, pushing the crowds back. The scene was an indescribable mixture of soldiers, gendarmes, diplomats, baggage, and Turkish functionaries. One of the most conspicuous figures was Bedri Bey, prefect of police, a lawyer politician, who had recently been elevated to this position, and who keenly realized the importance of his new office. Bedri was an intimate friend and a political subordinate of Talat, and one of his most valuable tools. He ranked high in the Committee of Union and Progress, and aspired ultimately to obtain a cabinet position. Perhaps his most impelling motive was his hatred of foreigners and foreign influence. In his eyes, Turkey was the land exclusively of the Turks. He despised all the other elements in its population, and he particularly resented the control which the foreign embassies had for years exerted in the domestic concerns of his country. Indeed, there were few men in Turkey with whom the permanent abolition of the capitulations was such a serious matter. Naturally, in the next few months I saw much of Bedri. He was constantly crossing my path, taking an almost malicious pleasure in interfering with every move which I made in the interest of the foreigners. His attitude was half provoking, half jocular. We were always trying to outwit each other, I attempting to protect the French and British, Bedri always turning up as an obstacle to my efforts. The fight for the foreigners, indeed, almost degenerated into a personal duel between the prefect of police and the American embassy. Bedri was capable, well-educated, very agile, and not particularly ill-natured, but he loved to toy with a helpless foreigner. Naturally, he found his occupation this evening a congenial one. "'What's all the trouble about?' I asked Bedri. "'We have changed our minds,' he said, and his manner showed that the change had not been displeasing to him. "'We shall let the train go that is to take the ambassadors and their staffs. But we have decided not to let the unofficial classes leave. That train that was to take them will not go.' My staff and I had worked hard to get this safe passage for the enemy nationals. Now apparently some influence had negatived our efforts. This sudden change in plans was producing the utmost confusion and consternation. At the station there were two groups of passengers, one of which could go, and the other of which could not. The British and French ambassadors did not wish to leave their nationals behind, and the latter refused to believe that their train, which the Turkish officials had definitely promised, would not start some time that evening. I immediately called up Enver, 
who substantiated Bedri's statement. Turkey had many subjects in Egypt, he said, whose situation was causing great anxiety. Before the French and English residents could leave Turkey, assurances must be given that the rights of Turkish subjects in these countries would be protected. I had no difficulty in arranging this detail, for Sir Louis Mallet immediately gave the necessary assurances. However, this did not settle the matter. Indeed, it had been little more than a pretext. Bedri still refused to let the train start. The order holding it up, he said, could not be rescinded, for that would now disarrange the general schedule, and might cause accidents. I recognized all this as mere Turkish evasion, and I knew that the order had come from a higher source than Bedri. Still nothing could be done at that moment. Moreover, Bedri would let no one get on the diplomatic train until I had personally identified him. So I had to stand at a little gate and pass upon each applicant. Every one, whether he belonged to the diplomatic corps or not, attempted to force himself through this narrow passageway, and we had an old-fashioned Brooklyn Bridge crush on a small scale. People were running in all directions, checking baggage, purchasing tickets, arguing with officials, consoling distracted women and frightened children, while Bedri, calm and collected, watched the whole pandemonium with an unsympathetic smile. Hats were knocked off, clothing was torn, and, to add to the confusion, Mallet, the British ambassador, became involved in a set-to with an officious Turk, the Englishman winning first honours easily, and I caught a glimpse of Bompard, the French ambassador, vigorously shaking a Turkish policeman. One lady dropped her baby in my arms, later another handed me a small boy, and still later, when I was standing at the gate, identifying Turkey's departing guests, one of the British secretaries made me the custodian of his dog. Meanwhile, Sir Louis Mallet became obstreperous and refused to leave. "'I shall stay here,' he said, "'until the last British subject leaves Turkey.' but I told him that he was no longer the protector of the British, that I, as American ambassador, had assumed this responsibility, and that I could hardly assert myself in this capacity if he remained in Constantinople. Certainly, I said, the Turks would not recognize me as in charge of British interests if you remain here. Moreover, I suggested that he remain at Dere Agach for a few days, and await the arrival of his fellow British. Sir Louis reluctantly accepted my point of view and boarded the train. As the train left the station, I caught my final glimpse of the British ambassador, sitting in a private car, almost buried in a mass of trunks, satchels, boxes, and diplomatic pouches, surrounded by his embassy staff, and sympathetically watched by his secretary's dog. The unofficial foreigners remained in the station several hours, hoping that, at the last moment, they would be permitted to go. Bedri, however, was inexorable. Their position was almost desperate. They had given up their quarters in Constantinople, and now found themselves practically stranded. Some were taken in by friends for the night, others found accommodations in hotels. But their situation caused the utmost anxiety. Evidently, despite all official promises, Turkey was determined to keep these foreign residents as hostages. On the one hand were Enver and Talat, telling me that they intended to conduct their war in a humane manner, and on the other were their underlings, such as Bedri, behaving in a fashion that negatived all these civilized pretensions. The fact was that the officials were quarreling among themselves about the treatment of foreigners, and the German general staff was telling the cabinet that they were making a great mistake in showing any leniency to their enemy aliens. Finally, I succeeded in making arrangements for them to leave the following day. Bedri, in more complacent mood, spent that afternoon at the embassy, visaying passports. We both went to the station in the evening and started the train safely toward Dede Agach. I gave a box of candy, Turkish delights, 
to each one of the fifty women and children on the train. It altogether was a happy party, and they made no attempt to hide their relief at leaving Turkey. At Dedeagach they met the diplomatic corps, and the reunion that took place, I afterward learned, was extremely touching. I was made happy by receiving many testimonials of their gratitude, in particular a letter, signed by more than a hundred, expressing their thanks to Mrs. Morgenthau, the embassy staff, and myself. There were still many who wished to go, and next day I called on Talat in their behalf. I found him in one of his most gracious moods. The cabinet, he said, had carefully considered the whole matter of English and French residents in Turkey, and my arguments, he added, had greatly influenced them. They had reached the formal decision that enemy aliens could leave or remain as they preferred. There would be no concentration camps. Civilians could pursue their usual business in peace, and, so long as they behaved themselves, they would not be molested." We propose to show, said Talat, by our treatment of aliens, that we are not a race of barbarians. In return for this promise he asked a favor of me. Would I not see that Turkey was praised in American and European press for this decision? After returning to the embassy I immediately sent for Mr. Theron Damon, correspondent of the Associated Press, Dr. Letterer, correspondent of the Berliner Tageblatt, and Dr. Sandler, who represented the Paris Herald, and gave them interviews, praising the attitude of Turkey toward the foreign residents. I also cabled the news to Washington, London, and Paris, and to all our consuls. Hardly had I finished with the correspondence when I again received alarming news. I had arranged for another train that evening, and I now heard that the Turks were refusing to visé the passports of those whose departure I had provided for. This news, coming right after Talat's explicit promise, was naturally disturbing. I immediately started for the railroad station, and the sight which I saw there increased my anger at the Minister of the Interior. A mass of distracted people filled the enclosure, the women were weeping and the children were screaming, while a platoon of Turkish soldiers, commanded by an undersized popinjay of a major, was driving everybody out of the station with the flat sides of their guns. Bedri, as usual, was there, and, as usual, he was clearly enjoying the confusion. Certain of the passengers, he told me, had not paid their income tax, and for this reason they would not be permitted to leave. I announced that I would be personally responsible for this payment. "'I can't get ahead of you, Mr. Ambassador, can I?' said Bedri, with a laugh. From this we all thought that my offer had settled the matter, and that the train would leave according to schedule. But then suddenly came another order holding it up again. Since I had just had a promise from Talat, I decided to find that functionary and learn what all this meant. I jumped into my automobile and went to the sublime port, where he usually had his headquarters. Finding no one there, I told the chauffeur to drive directly to Talat's house. Some time before I had visited Enver in his domestic surroundings, and this occasion now gave me the opportunity to compare his manner of life with that of his more powerful associate. The contrast was a startling one. I had found Enver living in luxury, in one of the most aristocratic parts of the town, while now I was driving to one of the poorer sections. We came to a narrow street bordered by little, rough, unpainted wooden houses. Only one thing distinguished this thoroughfare from all the others in Constantinople, and suggested that it was the abiding place of the most powerful man in the Turkish Empire. At either end stood a policeman, letting no one enter who could not give a satisfactory reason for doing so. Our auto, like all others, was stopped, but we were promptly permitted to pass when we explained who we were. As contrasted with Enver's palace, with its innumerable rooms and gorgeous furniture, Talat's house was an old, rickety, wooden three-story building. All this, I afterward learned, was part of the setting which Talat had staged for his career. Like many an American politician, 
he had found his position as a man of the people a valuable political asset, and he knew that a sudden display of prosperity and ostentation would weaken his influence with the Union and Progress Committee, most of whose members, like himself, had risen from the lower walks of life. The contents of the house were quite in keeping with the exterior. There were no suggestions of oriental magnificence. The furniture was cheap, a few coarse prints hung on the walls, and one or two well-worn rugs were scattered on the floor. On one side stood a wooden table, and on this rested a telegraph instrument, once Talat's means of earning a living, and now a means by which he communicated with his associates. In the present troubled conditions in Turkey, Talat sometimes preferred to do his own telegraphing. Amid these surroundings I awaited for a few minutes the entrance of the big boss of Turkey. In due time a door opened at the other end of the room, and a huge, lumbering, gaily decorated figure entered. I was startled by the contrast which this Talat presented to the one who had become such a familiar figure to me at the sublime port. It was no longer the Talat of the European clothes and the thin veneer of European manners. The man whom I now saw looked like a real Bulgarian gypsy. Talat wore the usual red Turkish fez, the rest of his bulky form was clothed in thick grey pyjamas, and from this combination protruded a round smiling face. His mood was half genial, half deprecating. Talat well understood what pressing business had led me to invade his domestic privacy, and his behaviour now resembled that of the unrepentant bad boy in school. He came and sat down with a good-natured grin, and began to make excuses. Quietly the door opened again, and a hesitating little girl was pushed into the room, bringing a tray of cigarettes and coffee. Presently I saw that a young woman, apparently about twenty-five years old, was standing back of the child, urging her to enter. Here, then, were Talat's wife and adopted daughter. I had already discovered that, while Turkish women never enter society or act as hostesses, they are extremely inquisitive about their husband's guests, and like to get surreptitious glimpses of them. Evidently Madame Talat, on this occasion, was not satisfied with her preliminary view, for, a few minutes afterward, she appeared at a window directly opposite me, but entirely unseen by her husband, who was facing in the other direction, and there she remained very quiet and very observant for several minutes. As she was in the house she was unveiled. Her face was handsome and intelligent, and it was quite apparent that she enjoyed this close-range view of an American ambassador. "'Well, Talat,' I said, realizing that the time had come for plain speaking, "'don't you know how foolishly you are acting? You told me a few hours ago that you had decided to treat the French and English decently, and you asked me to publish this news in the American and foreign press. I at once called in the newspaper men and told them how splendidly you were behaving. And this at your own request. The whole world will be reading about it to-morrow.' Now you are doing your best to counteract all my efforts in your behalf. Here you have repudiated your first promise to be decent. Are you going to keep the promises you made me? Will you stick to them, or do you intend to keep changing your mind all the time? Now let's have a real understanding. The thing we Americans particularly pride ourselves on is keeping our word. We do it as individuals and as a nation. We refuse to deal with people as equals who do not do this. You might as well understand now that we can do no business with each other unless I can depend on your promises. Now this isn't my fault, Talat answered. The Germans are to blame for stopping that train. The German chief of staff has just returned and is making a big fuss, saying that we are too easy with the French and English, and that we must not let them go away. He says that we must keep them for hostages. It was his interference that did this. That was precisely what I had suspected. Talat had given me his promise. Then Bronsart, head of the German staff, 
had practically countermanded his orders. Talat's admission gave me the opening which I had wished for. By this time my relations with Talat had become so friendly that I could talk to him with the utmost frankness. "'Now, Talat,' I said, "'you have got to have someone to advise you in your relations with foreigners. You must make up your mind whether you want me or the German staff. Don't you think you will make a mistake if you place yourself entirely in the hands of the Germans? The time may come when you will need me against them.' "'What do you mean by that?' he asked, watching for my answer with intense curiosity." The Germans are sure to ask you to do many things you don't want to do. If you can tell them that the American ambassador objects, my support may prove useful to you. Besides, you know you all expect peace in a few months. You know that the Germans really care nothing for Turkey, and certainly you have no claims on the Allies for assistance. There is only one nation in the world that you can look to as a disinterested friend, and that is the United States. This fact was so apparent that I hardly needed to argue it in any great detail. However, I had another argument that struck still nearer home. Already the struggle between the War Department and the civil powers had started. I knew that Talat, although he was Minister of the Interior and a civilian, was determined not to sacrifice a tittle of his authority to Enver, the Germans, and the representatives of the military. If you let the Germans win this point today, I said, you are practically in their power. You are now the head of affairs, but you are still a civilian. Are you going to let the military, represented by Enver and the German staff, overrule your orders? Apparently that is what has happened today. If you submit to it, you will find that they will be running things from now on. The Germans will put this country under martial law, then where will you civilians be? I could see that this argument was having its effect on Talat. He remained quiet for a few moments, evidently pondering my remarks. Then he said, with the utmost deliberation, I'm going to help you. He turned around to his table and began working his telegraph instrument. I shall never forget the picture. This huge Turk, sitting there in his gray pajamas and his red fez, working industriously his own telegraph key, his young wife gazing at him through a little window, and the late afternoon sun streaming into the room. Evidently the ruler of Turkey was having his troubles, and, as the argument went on over the telegraph, Talat would bang his key with increasing irritation. He told me that the pompous major at the station insisted on having Enver's written orders, since orders over the wire might easily be counterfeited. It took Talat some time to locate Enver, and then the dispute apparently started all over again. A piece of news which Talat received at that moment over the wire almost ruined my case. After a prolonged thumping of his instrument, in the course of which Talat's face lost its geniality and became almost savage, he turned to me and said, the English bombarded the Dardanelles this morning and killed two Turks. And then he added, We intend to kill three Christians for every Muslim killed. For a moment I thought that everything was lost. Talat's face reflected only one emotion, hatred of the English. Afterward, when reading the Cromer report on the Dardanelles, I found that the British committee stigmatized this early attack as a mistake, since it gave the Turks an early warning of their plans. I can testify that it was a mistake for another reason, for I now found that these few strange shots almost destroyed my plans to get the foreign residents out of Turkey. Talat was enraged, and I had to go over much of the ground again, but finally I succeeded in pacifying him once more. I saw that he was vacillating between his desire to punish the English and his desire to assert his own authority over that of Enver and the Germans. Fortunately, the latter motive gained ascendancy. At all hazard, he was determined to show that he was boss. We remained there for more than two hours, my involuntary host pausing now and then in his telegraphing 
to entertain me with the latest political gossip. Javid, the minister of finance, he said, had resigned, but had promised to work for them at home. The grand vizier, despite his threats, had been persuaded to retain his office. Foreigners in the interior would not be molested unless Beirut, Alexandretta, or some unfortified port were bombarded, but if such attacks were made, they would exact reprisals of the French and English. Talat's conversation showed that he had no particular liking for the Germans. They were overbearing and insolent, he said, constantly interfering in military matters and treating the Turks with disdain. Finally the train was arranged. Talat had shown several moods in this interview. He had been by turns sulky, good-natured, savage, and complacent. There is one phase of the Turkish character which Westerners do not comprehend, and that is its keen sense of humor. Talat himself greatly loved a joke and a funny story. Now that he had re-established friendly relations and redeemed his promise, Talat became jocular once more. "'Your people can go now,' he said with a laugh. "'It's time to buy your candies, Mr. Ambassador.' This latter, of course, was a reference to the little gifts which I had made to the women and children the night before. We immediately returned to the station, where we found the disconsolate passengers sitting around waiting for a favorable word. When I told them that the train would leave that evening, their thanks and gratitude were overwhelming. End of chapter 12《Ambassador Morgenthau's Story》by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13 The Invasion of Notre Dame de Sion. Talat's statement that the German chief of staff, Bronsart, had really held up this train was a valuable piece of information. I decided to look into the matter further, and with this idea in my mind, I called next day on Wangenheim. The Turkish authorities, I said, had solemnly promised that they would treat their enemies decently, and certainly I could not tolerate any interference in the matter from the German chief of staff. Wangenheim had repeatedly told me that the Germans were looking to President Wilson as the peacemaker, and I therefore used the same argument with him that I had urged on Talat. Proceedings of this sort would not help his country when the day of the final settlement came. Here, I said, we have a strange situation, a so-called barbarous country like Turkey attempting to make civilized warfare and treat their Christian enemies with decency and kindness, and on the other hand a supposedly cultured and Christian nation like Germany, which is trying to persuade them to revert to barbarism. What sort of an impression do you think that will make on the American people? I asked Wangenheim. He expressed a willingness to help, and suggested, as my consideration for such help, that I should try to persuade the United States to insist on free commerce with Germany, so that his country could receive plentiful cargoes of copper, wheat, and cotton. This was a subject to which, as I shall relate, Wangenheim constantly returned. Despite Wangenheim's promise, I had practically no support from the German embassy in my attempt to protect the foreign residents from Turkish ill-treatment. I realized that, owing to my religion, there might be a feeling in certain quarters that I was not exerting all my energies in behalf of these Christian peoples and religious organizations, hospitals, schools, monasteries, and convents, and I naturally thought that it would strengthen my influence with the Turks if I could have the support of my most powerful Christian colleagues. I had a long discussion on this matter with Pallavicini, himself a Catholic, and the representative of the greatest Catholic power. Pallavicini frankly told me that Wangenheim would do nothing that would annoy the Turks. There was then a constant fear that the English and French fleets would force the Dardanelles, capture Constantinople, and hand it over to Russia. And only the Turkish forces, said Pallavicini, 
could prevent such a calamity. The Germans, therefore, believed that they were dependent on the good graces of the Turkish government, and would do nothing to antagonize them. Evidently, Palavicini wished me to believe that Wangenheim and he really desired to help. Yet this plea was hardly frank, for I knew all the time that Turkey, if the Germans had not constantly interfered, would have behaved decently. I found that the evil spirit was not the Turkish government, but von Bransart, the German chief of staff. The fact that certain members of the Turkish cabinet, who represented European and Christian culture, men like Bustani and Oskan, had resigned as a protest against Turkey's action in entering the war, made the situation of foreigners even more dangerous. There was also much conflict of authority. A policy decided on one day would be reversed the next, the result being that we never knew where we stood. The mere fact that the government promised me that foreigners would not be maltreated by no means settled the matter, for some underling, like Bedri Bey, could frequently find an excuse for disregarding instructions. The situation, therefore, was one that called for constant vigilance. I had not only to get pledges from men like Talat and Enver, but I had personally to see that these pledges were carried into action. I awoke one November morning at four o'clock. I had been dreaming, or I had had a presentiment, that all was not going well with the Sciences, a French sisterhood which had for many years conducted a school for girls in Constantinople. Madame Bompard, the wife of the French ambassador, and several ladies of the French colony, had particularly requested us to keep a watchful eye on this institution. It was a splendidly conducted school. The daughters of many of the best families of all nationalities attended it, and when these girls were assembled, the Christians wearing silver crosses, and the non-Christians silver stars, the sight was particularly beautiful and impressive. Naturally, the thought of the brutal Turks breaking into such a community was enough to arouse the wrath of any properly constituted man. Though we had nothing more definite than an uneasy feeling that something might be wrong, Mrs. Morgenthau and I decided to go up immediately after breakfast. As we approached the building, we noted nothing particularly suspicious. The place was quiet, and the whole atmosphere was one of peace and sanctity. Just as we ascended the steps, however, five Turkish policemen followed on our heels. They crowded after us into the vestibule, much to the consternation of a few of the sisters who happened to be in the waiting-room. The mere fact that the American ambassador came with the police in itself increased their alarm, though our arrival together was purely accidental. "'What do you want?' I asked, turning to the men. As they spoke only Turkish, Naturally they did not understand me, and they started to push me aside. My own knowledge of Turkish was extremely limited, but I knew that the word Elchi meant ambassador. So, pointing to myself, I said, Elchi American. This scrap of Turkish worked like magic. In Turkey an ambassador is a much revered object, and these policemen immediately respected my authority. Meanwhile the sisters had sent for their superior, Mère Elvira. This lady was one of the most distinguished and influential personages in Constantinople. That morning, as she came in quietly and faced these Turkish policemen, showing not a sign of fear, and completely overawing them by the splendor and dignity of her bearing, she represented to my eyes almost a supernatural being. Mère Elvira was a daughter of one of the most aristocratic families of France. She was a woman of perhaps forty years of age, with black hair and shining black eyes, all accentuated by a pale face that radiated culture, character, and intelligence. I could not help thinking, as I looked at her that morning, that there was not a diplomatic circle in the world to which she would not have added grace and dignity. In a few seconds, Mère Elvira had this present distracting situation completely under control. She sent for a sister who spoke Turkish, and questioned the policemen. They said that they were acting under Bedri's orders. All the foreign schools were to be closed that morning, 
the government intending to seize all their buildings. There were about seventy-two teachers and sisters in this convent. The police had orders to shut all these into two rooms, where they were to be held practically as prisoners. There were about two hundred girls. These were to be turned out into the streets, and left to shift for themselves. The fact that it was raining in torrents, and that the weather was extremely cold, accentuated the barbarity of this proceeding. Yet every enemy school and religious institution in Constantinople was undergoing a similar experience at this time. Clearly this was a situation which I could not handle alone, and I at once telephoned my Turkish-speaking legal adviser. Herein is another incident which may have an interest for those who believe in providential intervention. When I arrived in Constantinople, telephones had been unknown, but in the last few months an English company had been introducing a system. The night before my experience with the Sciencieur, my legal adviser had called me up and proudly told me that his telephone had just been installed. I jotted down his number, and this memorandum I now found in my pocket. Without my interpreter I should have been hard-pressed, and without this telephone I could not have immediately brought him to the spot. While waiting for his arrival I delayed the operations of the policeman, and my wife, who fortunately speaks French, was obtaining all the details from the sisters. Mrs. Morgenthau understood the Turks well enough to know that they had other plans than the mere expulsion of the sisters and their charges. The Turks regard these institutions as repositories of treasure. The valuables which they contain are greatly exaggerated in the popular mind, and it was a safe assumption that, among other things, the expulsion was an industrious raiding expedition for tangible evidences of wealth. "'Have you any money and other valuables here?' Mrs. Morgenthau asked of one of the sisters. "'Yes, they had quite a large amount. It was kept in a safe upstairs. My wife told me to keep the policeman busy, and then she and one of the sisters quietly disappeared from the scene. Upstairs the sister disclosed about a hundred square pieces of white flannel, into each one of which had been sewn twenty gold coins.' In all, the Sciencieur had in this liquid form about fifty thousand francs. They had been fearing expulsion for some time, and had been getting together their money in this form, so that they could carry it away with them when forced to leave Turkey. Besides this, the sisters had several bundles of securities, and many valuable papers, such as the charter of their school. Certainly here was something that would appeal to Turkish cupidity. Mrs. Morgantown knew that if the police once obtained control of the building, there would be little likelihood that the Sciencieur would ever see their money again. With the aid of the sisters, my wife promptly concealed as much as she could on her person, descended the stairs, and marched through the line of gendarmes out into the rain. Mrs. Morgantown told me afterward that her blood almost ran cold with fright as she passed by these guardians of the law. From all external signs, however, she was absolutely calm and collected. She stepped into the waiting auto, was driven to the American embassy, placed the money in our vault, and promptly returned to the school. Again Mrs. Morgenthau solemnly ascended the stairs with the sisters. This time they took her to the gallery of the cathedral, which stood behind the convent, but could be entered through it. One of the sisters lifted up a tile from a particular spot in the floor, and again disclosed a heap of gold coins. This was secreted on Mrs. Morgenthau's clothes, and once more she walked past the gendarmes, out into the rain, and was driven rapidly to the embassy. In these two trips my wife succeeded in getting the money of the sisters to a place where it would be safe from the Turks. Between Mrs. Morgenthau's trips Bedri had arrived. He told me that Talat had himself given the order for closing all the institutions, and that they had intended to have the entire job finished before nine o'clock. I have already said that the Turks have a sense of humor, but to this statement I should add that it sometimes manifests itself in a perverted form. Bedri now seemed to think that locking more than seventy Catholic sisters in two rooms, 
and turning two hundred young and carefully nurtured girls into the streets of Constantinople with a great joke. "'We were going to go at it early in the morning and have it all over before you heard anything about it,' he said with a laugh, "'but you never seem to be asleep.' "'You are very foolish to try to play such tricks on us,' I said. "'Don't you know that I am going to write a book? "'If you go on behaving this way, I shall put you in as the villain.' This remark was an inspiration of the moment. It was then that it first occurred to me that these experiences might prove sufficiently interesting for publication. Bedry took the statement seriously, and it seemed to have a sobering effect— "'Do you really intend to write a book?' he asked, almost anxiously. "'Why not?' I rejoined. "'General Lew Wallace was minister here. Didn't he write a book? "'Sunset Cox was also minister here. Didn't he write one? Why shouldn't I? "'And you are such an important character that I shall have to give you a part. "'Why do you go on acting in a way that will make me describe you as a very bad man? "'These sisters here have always been your friends.' They have never done you anything but good. They have educated many of your daughters. Why do you treat them in this shameful fashion? This plea produced an effect. Bedri consented to postpone execution of the order until we could get Talat on the wire. In a few minutes I heard Talat laughing over the telephone. I tried to escape you, he said, but you have caught me again. Why make such a row about this matter? Didn't the French themselves expel all their nuns and monks? Why shouldn't we do it? After I had remonstrated over this indecent haste, Talat told Bedri to suspend the order until we had a chance to talk the matter over. Naturally, this greatly relieved Mère Elvira and the sisters. Just as we were about to leave, Bedri suddenly had a new idea. There was one detail which he had apparently forgotten. "'We'll leave the Sion sisters alone for the present,' he said, "'but we must get their money.' Reluctantly I acquiesced in his suggestion, knowing that all the valuables were safely reposing in the American embassy. So I had the pleasure of standing by and watching Bedri and his associates search the whole establishment. All they turned up was a small tin box containing a few copper coins, a prize which was so trifling that the Turks disdained to take it. They were much puzzled and disappointed, and from that day to this they have never known what became of the money. If my Turkish friends do me the honor of reading these pages, they will find that I have explained here for the first time one of the many mysteries of those exciting days. As some of the windows of the convent opened on the court of the cathedral, which was Vatican property, we contended that the Turkish government could not seize it. Such of the sisters, as were neutrals, were allowed to remain in possession of the part that faced the Vatican land, while the rest of the building was turned into an engineer's school. We arranged that the French nuns should have ten days to leave for their own country. They all reached their destination safely, and most are at present engaged in charities and war work in France. My jocular statement that I intended to write a book deeply impressed Bedri, and in the next few weeks he repeatedly referred to it. I kept banteringly telling him that, unless his behavior improved, I should be forced to picture him as the villain. One day he asked me, in all seriousness, whether he could not do something that would justify me in portraying him in a more favorable light. This attitude gave me an opportunity I had been seeking for some time. Constantinople had for many years been a center for the white slave trade, and a particularly vicious gang was then operating under cover of a fake synagogue. A committee, organized to fight this crew, had made me an honorary chairman. I told Bedri that he now had the chance to secure a reputation. Because of the war his powers as prefect of police had been greatly increased, and a little vigorous action on his part would permanently rid the city of this disgrace. The enthusiasm with which Bedri adopted my suggestion, and the thoroughness and ability with which he did the work, entitle him to the gratitude of all decent people. In a few days every white slave trader in Constantinople was scurrying for safety. Most were arrested, a few made their escape, 
such as were foreigners, after serving terms in jail, were expelled from the country. Bedri furnished me photographs of all the culprits, and they are now on file in our State Department. I was not writing a book at that time, but I felt obliged to secure some public recognition for Bedri's work. I therefore sent his photograph, with a few words about his achievement to the New York Times, which published it in a Sunday edition. That a great American newspaper had recognized him in this way delighted Bedri beyond words. For months he carried in his pocket the page of the Times containing his picture, showing it to all his friends. This event ended my troubles with the prefect of police. For the rest of my stay we had very few serious clashes. End of chapter 13「Chapter fourteen of Ambassador Morgenthau's story by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wangenheim and the Bethlehem Steel Company, a holy war that was made in Germany. All this time I was increasing my knowledge of the modern German character as illustrated in Wangenheim and his associates. In the early days of the war the Germans showed their most ingratiating side to the Americans. As time went on, however, and it became apparent that public opinion in the United States almost unanimously supported the Allies, and that the Washington administration would not disregard the neutrality laws in order to promote Germany's interest, this friendly attitude changed and became almost hostile. The grievance to which the German ambassador constantly returned with tiresome iteration was the old familiar one, the sale of American ammunition to the Allies. I hardly ever met him that he did not speak about it. He was constantly asking me to write to President Wilson, urging him to declare an embargo, of course my contention that the commerce in munitions was entirely legitimate made no impression. As the struggle at the Dardanelles became more intense, Wangenheim's insistence on the subject of American ammunition grew. He asserted that most of the shells used at the Dardanelles had been made in America, and that the United States was really waging war on Turkey. One day, more angry than usual, he brought me a piece of shell. On it clearly appeared the inscription, B.S. Company. "'Look at that,' he said. "'I suppose you know what B.S. Company means. That is the Bethlehem Steel Company. This will make the Turks furious. And remember that we are going to hold the United States responsible for it. We are getting more and more proof, and we are going to hold you to account for every death caused by American shells.' If you would only write home and make them stop selling ammunition to our enemies, the war would be over very soon. I made the usual defense, and called Wangenheim's attention to the fact that Germany had sold munitions to Spain in the Spanish War, but all this was to no purpose. All that Wangenheim saw was that American supplies formed an asset to his enemy. The legalities of the situation did not interest him. Of course I refused point-blank to write to the President about the matter. A few days afterward an article appeared in the Ikdam discussing Turkish and American relations. This contribution, for the greater part, was extremely complimentary to America. Its real purpose, however, was to contrast the present with the past, and to point out that our action in furnishing ammunition to Turkey's enemies was hardly in accordance with the historic friendship between the two countries. The whole thing was evidently written merely to get before the Turkish people a statement almost parenthetically included in the final paragraph. According to the report of correspondence at the Dardanelles, it appears that most of the shells fired by the British and French during the last bombardment were made in America. At this time the German embassy controlled the Ikdam, and was conducting it entirely in the interest of German propaganda. A statement of this sort, instilled into the minds of impressionable and fanatical Turks, might have the most deplorable consequences. I therefore took the matter up immediately with the man whom I regarded as chiefly responsible for the attack, the German ambassador. At first Wangenheim asserted his innocence. 
He was as bland as a child in protesting his ignorance of the whole affair. I called his attention to the fact that the statements in the ICDAM were almost identically the same as those which he had made to me a few days before, that the language in certain spots, indeed, was almost a repetition of his own conversation. "'Either you wrote that article yourself,' I said, "'or you called in the reporter and gave him the leading ideas.' Fangenheim saw that there was no use in further denying the authorship. "'Well,' he said, throwing back his head, "'what are you going to do about it?' This tweed-like attitude rather nettled me, and I resented it on the spot. "'I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it,' I replied, "'and you know that I will be able to carry out my threats. Either you stop stirring up anti-American feeling in Turkey, or I shall start a campaign of anti-German sentiment here.' "'You know, Baron,' I added, "'that you Germans are skating on very thin ice in this country. "'You know that the Turks don't love you any too well. "'In fact, you know that Americans are more popular here than you are. "'Supposing that I go out, tell the Turks how you are simply using them for your own benefit, "'that you do not really regard them as your allies, "'but merely as pawns in the game which you are playing. "'Now, in stirring up anti-American feeling here, you are touching my softest spot. You are exposing our educational and religious institutions to the attacks of the Turks. No one knows what they may do if they are persuaded that their relatives are being shot down by American bullets. You stop this at once, or in three weeks I will fill the whole of Turkey with animosity toward the Germans. It will be a battle between us, and I am ready for it. Wangenheim's attitude changed at once. He turned around, put his arm on my shoulder, and assumed a most conciliatory, almost affectionate manner. "'Come, let us be friends,' he said. "'I see that you are right about this. I see that such attacks might injure your friends, the missionaries. I promise you that they will be stopped.' From that day the Turkish press never made the slightest unfriendly allusion to the United States. The abruptness with which the attacks ceased showed me that the Germans had evidently extended to Turkey one of the most cherished expedients of the fatherland, absolute government control of the press. But when I think of the infamous plots which Wangenheim was instigating at that moment, his objection to the use of a few American shells by English battleships, if English battleships used any such shells, which I seriously doubt, seems almost grotesque. In the early days, Wangenheim had explained to me one of Germany's main purposes in forcing Turkey into the conflict. He made this explanation quietly and nonchalantly, as though it had been quite the most ordinary matter in the world. Sitting in his office, puffing away at his big black German cigar, he unfolded Germany's scheme to arouse the whole fanatical Moslem world against the Christians. Germany had planned a real holy war, as one means of destroying English and French influence in the world. Turkey herself is not the really important matter, said Wangenheim. Her army is a small one, and we do not expect it to do very much. For the most part I will act on the defensive. But the big thing is the Muslim world. If we can stir the Mohammedans up against the English and Russians, we can force them to make peace." What Wangenheim evidently meant by the big thing became apparent on November 13th, when the Sultan issued his declaration of war. This declaration was really an appeal for a jihad, or a holy war, against the infidel. Soon afterward, the Sheikh ul Islam published his proclamation, summoning the whole Muslim world to arise and massacre their Christian oppressors. O Muslims, concluded this document, Ye who are smitten with happiness are now on the verge of sacrificing your life and your goods for the cause of right and braving perils. Gather now around the imperial throne, obey the commands of the Almighty, who, in the Koran, promises us bliss in this and in the next world. Embrace ye the foot of the Caliph's throne, and know ye that the state is at war with Russia, England, France, and their allies, and that these are the enemies of Islam. The chief of the believers, the caliph, 
invites you all as Muslims to join in the holy war. The religious leaders read this proclamation to their assembled congregations in the mosques. All the newspapers printed it conspicuously. It was spread broadcast in all the countries which had large Mohammedan populations, India, China, Persia, Egypt, Algiers, Tripoli, Morocco, and the like. In all these places it was read to the assembled multitudes, and the populace was exhorted to obey the mandate. The Ikdam, the Turkish newspaper which had passed into German ownership, was constantly inciting the masses. The deeds of our enemies, wrote this Turco-German editor, have brought down the wrath of God. A gleam of hope has appeared. All Mohammedans, young and old, men, women, and children, must fulfill their duty so that the gleam may not fade away, but give light to us forever. How many great things can be accomplished by the arms of vigorous men, by the aid of others, of women and children? The time for action has come. We shall all have to fight with all our strength, with all our soul, with teeth and nails, and all the sinews of our bodies and of our spirits. If we do it, the deliverance of the subjected Mohammedan kingdoms is assured. Then, if God so wills, we shall march unashamed by the side of our friends who send their greetings to the crescent. Allah is our aid, and the Prophet is our support. The Sultan's proclamation was an official public document, and dealt with the proposed holy war only in a general way, but about this same time a secret pamphlet appeared which gave instructions to the faithful in more specific terms. This paper was not read in the mosques. It was distributed stealthily in all Mohammedan countries, India, Egypt, Morocco, Syria, and many others, and it was significantly printed in Arabic, the language of the Koran. It was a lengthy document. The English translation contains ten thousand words, full of quotations from the Koran, and its style was frenzied in its appeal to racial and religious hatred. It described a detailed plan of operations for the assassination and extermination of all Christians, except those of German nationality. A few extracts will fairly portray its spirit. O people of the faith, and O beloved Muslims, consider, even though but for a brief moment, the present condition of the Islamic world. For if you consider this but for a little, you will weep long. You will behold a bewildering state of affairs which will cause the tear to fall and the fire of grief to blaze. You see the great country of India, which contains hundreds of millions of Muslims, fallen, because of religious divisions and weaknesses, into the grasp of the enemies of God, the infidel English. You see forty millions of Muslims in Java, shackled by the chains of captivity and of affliction under the rule of the Dutch, although these infidels are much fewer in number than the faithful, and do not enjoy a much higher civilization. You see Egypt, Morocco, Tunis, Algier, and the Sudan suffering the extremes of pain, and groaning in the grasp of the enemies of God and his apostle. You see the vast country of Siberia and Turkestan, and Kiva and Bokhara, and the Caucasus and the Crimea, and Kazan and Efrahan and Kozahistan, whose Muslim peoples believe in the unity of God, ground under the feet of their oppressors, who are the enemies already of our religion. You behold Persia being prepared for partition, and you see the city of the Caliphate, which for ages has unceasingly fought breast to breast with the enemies of our religion, now become the target for oppression and violence. Thus, wherever you look, you see that the enemies of the true religion, particularly the English, the Russian, and the French, have oppressed Islam and invaded its rights in every possible way. We cannot enumerate the insults we have received at the hands of these nations, who desire totally to destroy Islam and drive all Mohammedans off the face of the earth. This tyranny has passed all endurable limits. The cup of our oppression is full to overflowing. In brief, the Muslims work and the infidels eat,
the Muslims are hungry and suffer, and the infidels gorge themselves and live in luxury. The world of Islam sinks down and goes backward, and the Christian world goes forward, and is more and more exalted. The Muslims are enslaved, and the infidels are the great rulers. This is all because the Muslims have abandoned the plan set forth in the Koran, and ignored the holy war which it commands. But the time has now come for the holy war, and by this the land of Islam shall be forever freed from the power of the infidels who oppress it. This holy war has now become a sacred duty. Know ye that the blood of infidels in the Islamic lands may be shed with impunity, except those to whom the Muslim power has promised security and who are allied with it. Herein we find that Germans and Austrians are accepted from massacre. The killing of infidels who rule over Islam has become a sacred duty, whether you do it secretly or openly, as the Koran has decreed. Take them and kill them whenever you find them. Behold, we have delivered them unto your hands, and given you supreme power over them. He who kills even one unbeliever of those who rule over us, whether he does it secretly or openly, shall be rewarded by God. And let every Muslim, in whatever part of the world he may be, swear a solemn oath to kill at least three or four of the infidels who rule over him, for they are the enemies of God and of the faith. Let every Muslim know that his reward for doing so shall be doubled by God who created heaven and earth. A Muslim who does this shall be saved from the terrors of the day of judgment, of the resurrection of the dead. Who is the man who can refuse such a recompense for such a small deed? Yet the time has come that we should rise up as the rising of one man, in one hand a sword, in the other a gun, in his pocket balls of fire and death-dealing missiles, and in his heart the light of the faith, that we should lift up our voices, saying, India for the Indian Muslims, Java for the Javanese Muslims, Algeria for the Algerian Muslims, Morocco for the Moroccan Muslims, Tunis for the Tunisian Muslims, Egypt for the Egyptian Muslims, Iran for the Iranian Muslims, Tehran for the Tehranian Muslims, Bokhara for the Bokharan Muslims, Caucasus for the Caucasian Muslims, and the Ottoman Empire for the Ottoman Turks and Arabs. Specific instructions for carrying out this holy purpose follow. There shall be a heart war. Every follower of the Prophet, that is, shall constantly nourish in his spirit a hatred of the infidel. A speech war, with tongue and pen, every Muslim shall spread this same hatred wherever Mohammedans live, and a war of deed-fighting and killing the infidel wherever he shows his head. This latter conflict, says the pamphlet, is the true war. There is to be a little holy war, and a great holy war. The first describes the battle which every Mohammedan is to wage in his community against his Christian neighbors, and the second is the great world struggle which united Islam in India, Arabia, Turkey, Africa, and other countries is to wage against the infidel oppressors. The holy war, says the pamphlet, will be of three forms. First, the individual war, which consists of the individual personal deed. This may be carried on with cutting, killing instruments, like the holy war which one of the faithful made against Peter Gailey, the infidel English governor, like the slain of the English chief of the police of India, and like the killing of one of the officials arriving in Mecca by Abir Busir, may God be pleased with him. The document gives several other instances of assassination which the faithful are enjoined to imitate. Second, the believers are told to organize bands, and to go forth and slay Christians. The most useful are those organized and operating in secret. It is hoped that the Islamic world of today will profit very greatly from such secret bands. The third method is by organized campaigns, that is, by trained armies.
in all parts of this incentive to murder and assassination there are indications that a german hand has exercised an editorial supervision only those infidels are to be slain who rule over us that is those who have mohammedan subjects as germany has no such subjects this saving clause was expected to protect germans from assault the germans with their usual interest in their own well-being and their usual disregard of their ally evidently overlooked the fact that austria had many mohammedan subjects in bosnia and herzegovina muslims are instructed that they should form armies even though it may be necessary to introduce some foreign elements that is bring in german instructors and german officers you must remember this is evidently intended as a blanket protection to germans everywhere that it is absolutely unlawful to oppose any of the peoples of other religions between whom and the muslims there is a covenant or of those who have not manifested hostility to the seat of the caliphate or those who have entered under the protection of the muslims even though i had not had wangenheim's personal statement that the germans intended to arouse the mohammedans everywhere against england france and russia these interpolations would clearly enough have indicated the real inspiration of this amazing document at the time wangenheim discussed the matter with me his chief idea seemed to be that a holy war of this sort would be the quickest means of forcing england to make peace according to this point of view it really was a great piece of offensive at that time wangenheim reflected the conviction which was prevalent in all official circles that germany had made a mistake in bringing england into the conflict and it was evidently his idea now that if backfires should be started against england in india egypt the sudan and other places the british empire would withdraw even if british mohammedans refused to rise wangenheim believed that the mere threat of such an uprising would induce england to abandon belgium and france to their fate the danger of spreading such incendiary literature among a wildly fanatical people is apparent i was not the only neutral diplomat who feared the most serious consequences monsieur tocheff the bulgarian minister one of the ablest members of the diplomatic corps was much disturbed at that time bulgaria was neutral and monsieur tocheff used to tell me that his country hoped to maintain this neutrality each side he said expected that bulgaria would become its ally and it was bulgaria's policy to keep each side in this expectant frame of mind should germany succeed in starting a holy war and should massacres result bulgaria added monsieur tocheff would certainly join forces with the entente we arranged that he should call upon wangenheim and repeat this statement and that i should bring similar pressure to bear upon enver from the first however the holy war proved a failure the mohammedans of such countries as india egypt algier and morocco knew that they were getting far better treatment that they could obtain under any other conceivable conditions moreover the simple-minded mohammedans could not understand why they should prosecute a holy war against christians and at the same time have christian nations such as germany and austria as their partners this association made the whole proposition ridiculous the koran it is true commands the slaughter of christians but that sacred volume makes no exception in favor of the germans and in the mind of the fanatical mohammedan a german raya is as much christian dirt as an englishman or a frenchman and his massacre is just as meritorious an act the fine distinctions necessitated by european diplomacy he understands about as completely as he understands the laws of gravitation or the nebular hypothesis the german failure to take this into account is only another evidence of the fundamental german clumsiness and real ignorance of racial psychology the only tangible fact that stands out clearly is the kaiser's desire 
to let loose three hundred million Mohammedans in a gigantic St. Bartholomew massacre of Christians. Was there then no holy war at all? Did Wangenheim's big thing really fail? Whenever I think of this burlesque jihad, a particular scene in the American embassy comes to my mind. On one side of the table sits Enver, most peacefully sipping tea and eating cakes, and on the other side is myself, engaged in the same unwarlike occupation. It is November 14th, the day after the Sultan has declared this holy war. There have been meetings at the mosques and other places, at which the declaration has been read, and fiery speeches made. Enver now assures me that absolutely no harm will come to Americans. In fact, there will be no massacres anyway. While he is talking, one of my secretaries comes in, and tells me that a little mob is making demonstrations against certain foreign establishments. It has assailed an Austrian shop, which has unwisely kept up its sign, saying that it has English clothes for sale. I ask Enver what this means. He answers that it is all a mistake. There is no intention of attacking anybody. A little while after he leaves, I am informed that the mob has attacked the Bon Marché, a French dry-goods store, and is heading directly for the British Embassy. I at once call Enver on the telephone. It is all right, he says. Nothing will happen to the Embassy. A minute or two after, the mob immediately wheels about and starts for Tocatlian's, the most important restaurant in Constantinople. The fact that this is conducted by an Armenian makes it fair game. Six men who have poles, with hooks at the end, break all the mirrors and windows. Others take the marble tops of the tables and smash them to bits. In a few minutes the place has been completely gutted. This demonstration comprised the holy war, so far as Constantinople understood it. Such was the inglorious end of Germany's attempt to arouse three hundred million Mohammedans against the Christian world. Only one definite result did the Kaiser accomplish by spreading this inciting literature. It aroused in the Mohammedan soul all that intense animosity toward the Christian which is the fundamental fact in his strange emotional nature and thus started passions aflame that afterwards spent themselves in the massacres of the Armenians and other subject peoples. End of chapter 14「fifteen of Ambassador Morgenthau's Story by Henry Morgenthau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Jemal, a troublesome Mark Antony, the first German attempt to get a German peace. In early November 1914, the railroad station at Haidar Pasha was the scene of a great demonstration. Jemal, the Minister of Marine, one of the three men who were then the most powerful in the Turkish Empire, was leaving to take command of the 4th Turkish Army, which had its headquarters in Syria. All the members of the cabinet and other influential people in Constantinople assembled to give this departing satrap an enthusiastic farewell. They hailed him as the saviour of Egypt, and Jemal himself, just before his train started, made this public declaration. I shall not return to Constantinople until I have conquered Egypt. The whole performance seemed to me to be somewhat bombastic. Inevitably it called to mind the third member of another bloody triumvirate who, nearly two thousand years before, had left his native land to become the supreme dictator of the East. And Djemal had many characteristics in common with Mark Antony. Like his Roman predecessor, his private life was profligate. Like Antony, he was an insatiate gambler, spending much of his leisure over the card-table at the Cirque d'Orient. Another trait which he had in common with the great Roman orator was his enormous vanity. The Turkish world seemed to be disintegrating in Jemal's time, just as the Roman Republic was dissolving in the days of Antony, 
Jemal believed that he might himself become the heir of one or more of its provinces, and possibly establish a dynasty. He expected that the military expedition on which he was now starting would make him not only the conqueror of Turkey's fairest province, but also one of the powerful figures of the world. Afterward, in Syria, he ruled as independently as a medieval robber baron, whom in other details he resembled. He became a kind of sub-sultan, holding his own court, having his own selamlik, issuing his own orders, dispensing freely his own kind of justice, and often disregarding the authorities at Constantinople. The applause with which Jemal's associates were speeding his departure was not entirely disinterested. The fact was that most of them were exceedingly glad to see him go. He had been a thorn in the side of Talat and Enver for some time, and they were perfectly content that he should exercise his imperious and stubborn nature against the Syrians, Armenians, and other non-Muslim elements in the Mediterranean provinces. Jemal was not a popular man in Constantinople. The other members of the triumvirate, in addition to their less desirable qualities, had certain attractive traits. Talat, his rough virility and spontaneous good nature, Enver, his courage and personal graciousness, but there was little about Jemal that was pleasing. An American physician who had specialized in the study of physiognomy had found Jemal a fascinating subject. He told me that he had never seen a face that so combined ferocity with great power and penetration. Enver, as his history showed, could be cruel and bloodthirsty, but he hid his more insidious qualities under a face that was bland, unruffled, and even agreeable. Jemal, however, did not disguise his tendencies, for his face clearly pictured the inner soul. His eyes were black and piercing, their sharpness, the rapidity and keenness with which they darted from one object to another, taking in apparently everything with a few lightning-like glances, signalized cunning, remorselessness, and selfishness to an extreme degree. Even his laugh, which disclosed all his white teeth, was unpleasant and animal-like. His black hair and black beard, contrasting with his pale face, only heightened this impression. At first Jemal's figure seemed somewhat insignificant. He was undersized, almost stumpy, and somewhat stoop-shouldered. As soon as he began to move, however, it was evident that his body was full of energy. Whenever he shook your hand, gripping you with a vice-like grasp, and looking at you with those roving, penetrating eyes, the man's personal force became impressive. Yet, after a momentary meeting, I was not surprised to hear that Jemal was a man with whom assassination and judicial murder were all a part of the day's work. Like all the young Turks, his origin had been extremely humble. He had joined the Committee of Union and Progress in the early days, and his personal power, as well as his relentlessness, had rapidly made him one of the leaders. After the murder of Nazim, Jemal had become military governor of Constantinople, his chief duty in this post being to remove from the scene the opponents of the ruling powers. This congenial task he performed with great skill, and the reign of terror that resulted was largely Jemal's handiwork. Subsequently Jemal became member of the cabinet, but he could not work harmoniously with his associates. He was always a troublesome partner. In the days preceding the break with the Entente, he was popularly regarded as a Francophile. Whatever feeling Jemal may have entertained toward the Entente, he made little attempt to conceal his detestation of the Germans. It is said that he would swear at them in their presence, in Turkish of course, and he was one of the few important Turkish officials who never came under their influence. The fact was that, Jemal represented that tendency which was rapidly gaining ascendancy in Turkish policy, pan-Turkism. He despised the subject peoples of the Ottoman country, 
Arabs, Greeks, Armenians, Circassians, Jews, it was his determination to Turkify the whole empire. His personal ambition brought him into frequent conflict with Enver and Talat, who told me many times that they could not control him. It was for this reason that, as I have said, they were glad to see him go. Not that they really expected him to capture the Suez Canal and drive the English out of Egypt. Incidentally, this appointment fairly indicated the incongruous organization that then existed in Turkey. As Minister of Marine, Jemal's real place was at the Navy Department. Instead of working in his official field, the head of the Navy was sent to lead an army over the burning sands of Syria and Sinai. Yet Jemal's expedition represented Turkey's most spectacular attempt to assert its military power against the Allies. As Jemal moved out of the station, the whole Turkish populace felt that an historic moment had arrived. Turkey in less than a century had lost the greater part of her dominions, and nothing had more pained the national pride than the English occupation of Egypt. All during this occupation Turkish suzerainty had been recognized. As soon as Turkey declared war on Great Britain, however, the British had ended this fiction, and had formally taken over this great province. Jemal's expedition was Turkey's reply to this act of England. The real purpose of the war, the Turkish people had been told, was to restore the vanishing empire of the Osmans, and to this great undertaking the recovery of Egypt was merely the first step. The Turks also knew that, under English administration, Egypt had become a prosperous country, and that it would, therefore, yield great treasure to the conqueror. It is no wonder that the huzzas of the Turkish people followed the departing Jemal. About the same time Enver left to take command of Turkey's other great military enterprise, the attack on Russia through the Caucasus. Here also were Turkish provinces to be redeemed. After the war of 1878, Turkey had been compelled to cede to Russia certain rich territories between the Caspian and the Black Seas, inhabited chiefly by Armenians, and it was this country which Enver now proposed to conquer. But Enver had no ovation on his leaving. He went away quietly and unobserved. With the departure of these two men, the war was now fairly on. Despite these martial enterprises, other than warlike preparations were now under way in Constantinople. At that time, in the latter part of 1914, its external characteristics suggested nothing but war, yet now it suddenly became the great headquarters of peace. The English fleet was constantly threatening the Dardanelles, and every day Turkish troops were passing through the streets. Yet these activities did not chiefly engage the attention of the German embassy. Wangenheim was thinking of one thing and of one thing only. This fire-eating German had suddenly become a man of peace, for he now learned that the greatest service which a German ambassador could render his emperor would be to end the war on terms that would save Germany from exhaustion and even from ruin to obtain a settlement that would reinstate his fatherland in the society of nations. In November, Wangenheim began discussing this subject. It was part of Germany's system, he told me, not only to be completely prepared for war, but also for peace. A wise general, when he begins his campaign, always has at hand his plans for a retreat, in case he is defeated, said the German ambassador. This principle applies just the same to a nation beginning war. There is only one certainty about war, and that is that it must end some time. So, when we plan war, we must consider also a campaign for peace. But Wangenheim was interested then in something more tangible than this philosophic principle. Germany had immediate reasons for desiring the end of hostilities, and Wangenheim discussed them frankly and cynically. He said that Germany had prepared only for a short war, because she had expected to crush France and Russia in two brief campaigns, lasting not longer than six months. Clearly this plan had failed, and there was little likelihood that Germany would win the war.
Wangenheim told me this in so many words. Germany, he added, would make a great mistake if she persisted in fighting to the point of exhaustion, for such a fight would mean the permanent loss of her colonies, her mercantile marine, and her whole economic and commercial status. If we don't get Paris in thirty days, we are beaten, Wangenheim had told me in August, and though his attitude changed somewhat after the Battle of the Marne, he made no attempt to conceal the fact that the Great Rush campaign had collapsed, that all the Germans could now look forward to was a tedious, exhausting war, and that all they could obtain from the existing situation would be a drawn battle. We have made a mistake this time, Wangenheim said, in not laying in supplies for a protracted struggle. It was an error, however, that we shall not repeat. Next time we shall store up enough copper and cotton to last for five years. Wangenheim had another reason for wishing an immediate peace, and it was a reason which shed much light upon the shamelessness of German diplomacy. The preparation which Turkey was making for the conquest of Egypt caused this German ambassador much annoyance and anxiety. The interest and energy which the Turks had manifested in this enterprise were particularly giving him concern. Naturally, I thought at first that Wangenheim was worried that Turkey would lose, yet he confided to me that his real fear was that his ally might succeed. A victorious Turkish campaign in Egypt, Wangenheim explained, might seriously interfere with Germany's plans. Should Turkey conquer Egypt, naturally Turkey would insist at the peace table on retaining this great province, and would expect Germany to support her in this claim. But Germany had no intention then of promoting the re-establishment of the Turkish Empire. At that time she hoped to reach an understanding with England, the basis of which was to be something in the nature of a division of interests in the East. Germany desired above all to obtain Mesopotamia as an indispensable part of her Hamburg-Baghdad scheme. In return for this she was prepared to give her endorsement to England's annexation of Egypt. Thus it was Germany's plan at that time that she and England should divide Turkey's two fairest dominions. This was one of the proposals which Germany intended to bring forth in the peace conference which Wangenheim was now scheming for, and clearly Turkey's conquest of Egypt would have presented complications in the way of carrying out this plan. In the morality of Germany's attitude to her ally, Turkey, it is hardly necessary to comment. The whole thing was all of a piece with Germany's policy of realism in foreign relations. Nearly all German classes, in the latter part of 1914 and the early part of 1915, were anxiously looking for peace, and they turned to Constantinople as the most promising spot where peace negotiations might most favorably be started. The Germans took it for granted that President Wilson would be the peacemaker. Indeed, they never for a moment thought of anyone else in this capacity. The only point that remained for consideration was the best way to approach the President. Such negotiations would most likely be conducted through one of the American ambassadors in Europe. Obviously Germany had no means of access to the American ambassadors in the great enemy capitals, and other circumstances induced the German statesmen to turn to the American ambassador in Turkey. At this time a German diplomat appeared in Constantinople who has figured much in recent history. Dr. Richard von Kuhlmann, afterward Minister for Foreign Affairs. In the last five years, Dr. von Kuhlmann has seemed to appear in that particular part of the world where important confidential diplomatic negotiations are being conducted by the German Empire. Prince Lichnowsky has described his activities in London in 1913 and 1914, and he figured even more conspicuously in the infamous peace treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Soon after the war started, Dr. von Kuhlmann came to Constantinople as conseiller of the German embassy, succeeding von Mutius, who had been called to the colors. For one reason his appointment was appropriate, for Kuhlmann had been born in Constantinople, and had spent his early life there, his father having been president of the Anatolian Railway. 
He therefore understood the Turks as only one can who has lived with them for many years. Personally, he proved to be an interesting addition to the diplomatic colony. He impressed me as not a particularly aggressive, but a very entertaining man. He apparently wished to become friendly with the American embassy, and he possessed a certain attraction for us all, as he had just come from the trenches and gave us many vivid pictures of life at the front. At that time we were all keenly interested in modern warfare, and Kuhlmann's details of trench fighting held us spellbound many an afternoon and evening. His other favorite topic of conversation was Weltpolitik, and on all foreign matters he struck me as remarkably well informed. At that time we did not regard von Kuhlmann as an important man, yet the industry with which he attended to his business attracted everyone's attention even then. Soon, however, I began to have a feeling that he was exerting a powerful influence in a quiet, velvety kind of way. He said little, but I realized that he was listening to everything and storing all kinds of information away in his mind. He was apparently Wangenheim's closest confidant, and the man upon whom the ambassador was depending for his contact with the German Foreign Office. About the middle of December, von Kuhlmann left for Berlin, where he stayed about two weeks. On his return, in the early part of January 1915, there was a noticeable change in the atmosphere of the German embassy. Up to that time, Wangenheim had discussed peace negotiations more or less informally, but now he took up the matter specifically. I gathered that Kuhlmann had been called to Berlin to receive all the latest details on this subject, and that he had come back with the definite instructions that Wangenheim should move at once. In all my talks with the German ambassador on peace, Kuhlmann was always hovering in the background. At one most important conference he was present, though he participated hardly at all in the conversation, but his role, as usual, was that of a subordinate and quietly eager listener. Wangenheim now informed me that January 1915 would be an excellent time to end the war. Italy had not yet entered, though there was every reason to believe that she would do so by spring. Bulgaria and Romania were still holding aloof, though no one expected that their waiting attitude would last forever. France and England were preparing for the first of the six spring offensives, and the Germans had no assurance that it would not succeed. Indeed, they much feared that the German armies would meet disaster. The British and French warships were gathering at the Dardanelles, and the German general staff and practically all military and naval experts in Constantinople believed that the Allied fleets could force their way through and capture the city. Most Turks by this time were sick of the war, and Germany always had in mind that Turkey might make a separate peace. Afterward I discovered that whenever the military situation looked ominous to Germany, she was always thinking about peace, but that if the situation improved, she would immediately become warlike again. It was a case of sick devil, well devil. Yet, badly as Wangenheim wanted peace in January 1915, it was quite apparent that he was not thinking of a permanent peace. The greatest obstacle to peace at that time was the fact that Germany showed no signs that she regretted her crimes, and there was not the slightest evidence of the sackcloth in Wangenheim's attitude now. Germany had made a bad guess, that was all. What Wangenheim and the other Germans saw in the situation was that their stock of wheat, cotton, and copper was inadequate for a protracted struggle. In my notes of my conversations with Wangenheim, I find him frequently using such phrases as the next war, next time, and in confidently looking forward to another greater world cataclysm than the present, he merely reflected the attitude of the dominant Junker military class. The Germans apparently wanted a reconciliation, a kind of armistice, that would give their generals and industrial leaders time to prepare for the next conflict. At that time, nearly four years ago, Germany was moving for practically the same kind of peace negotiations which she has suggested many times since, and is suggesting now, 
Wangenheim's plan was that representatives of the warring powers should gather around a table and settle things on the principle of give and take. He said that there was no sense in demanding that each side state its terms in advance. For both sides to state their terms in advance would ruin the whole thing, he said. What would we do? Germany, of course, would make claims which the other side would regard as ridiculously extravagant. The Entente would state terms which would put all Germany in a rage. As a result, both sides would get so angry that there would be no conference. No, if we really want to end this war, we must have an armistice. Once we stop fighting, we shall not go at it again. History presents no instance in a great war where an armistice has not resulted in peace. It will be so in this case. Yet from Wangenheim's conversation I did obtain a slight inkling of Germany's terms. The matter of Egypt and Mesopotamia set forth above was one of them. Wangenheim was quite insistent that Germany must have permanent naval bases in Belgium, with which her navy could at all times threaten England with blockade, and so make sure the freedom of the seas. Germany wanted coaling rights everywhere. This demand looks absurd, because Germany has always possessed such rights in peace times. She might give France a piece of Lorraine and a part of Belgium, perhaps Brussels, in return for the payment of an indemnity. Wangenheim requested that I should place Germany's case before the American government. My letter to Washington is dated January 11, 1915. It went fully into the internal situation which then prevailed, and gave the reasons why Germany and Turkey desired peace. A particularly interesting part of this incident was that Germany was apparently ignoring Austria. Palavicini, the Austrian ambassador, knew nothing of the pending negotiations until I myself informed him of them. In thus ignoring his ally, the German ambassador meant no personal disrespect, he was merely treating him precisely as his foreign office was treating Vienna, not as an equal, but practically as a retainer. The world is familiar enough with Germany's military and diplomatic absorption of Austria-Hungary, but that Wangenheim should have made so important a move as to attempt peace negotiations, and have left it to Palavicini to learn about it through a third party shows that, as far back as January 1915, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had ceased to be an independent nation. Nothing came of this proposal, of course. Our government declined to take action, evidently not regarding the time as opportune. Both Germany and Turkey, as I shall tell, recurred to this subject afterward. This particular negotiation ended in the latter part of March, when Kühlmann left Constantinople to become minister at The Hague. He came and paid his farewell call at the American Embassy, as charming, as entertaining, and as debonair as ever. His last words as he shook my hand and left the building were, subsequent events have naturally caused me to remember them, "'We shall have peace within three months, Excellency.' This little scene took place, and this happy forecast was made, in March 1915. End of chapter 15「The Turks prepare to flee from Constantinople and establish a new capital in Asia Minor, the Allied fleet bombarding the Dardanelles. Probably one thing that stimulated this German desire for peace was the situation at the Dardanelles. In early January, when Wangenheim persuaded me to write my letter to Washington, Constantinople was in a state of the utmost excitement. It was reported that the Allies had assembled a fleet of forty warships at the mouth of the Dardanelles, and that they intended to attempt the forcing of the Straits. What made the situation particularly tense was the belief, which then generally prevailed in Constantinople, that such an attempt would succeed. Wangenheim shared this belief, and, so, in a modified form, did von der Goltz, 
who probably knew as much about the Dardanelles' defenses as any other man, as he had for years been Turkey's military instructor. I find in my diary von der Goltz's precise opinion on this point, as reported to me by Wangenheim, and I quote it exactly as written at that time. Although he thought it was almost impossible to force the Dardanelles, still, if England thought it an important move of the general war, they could, by sacrificing ten ships, force the entrance, and do it very fast, and be up in the Marmara within ten hours from the time they forced it. The very day that Wangenheim gave me this expert opinion of von der Goltz, he asked me to store several cases of his valuables in the American embassy. Evidently he was making preparations for his own departure. Reading the Cromer report on the Dardanelles bombardment, I find that Admiral Sir John Fisher, then First Sea Lord, placed the price of success at twelve ships. Evidently von der Goltz and Fisher did not differ materially in their estimates. The situation of Turkey, when these first rumors of an Allied bombardment reached us, was fairly desperate. On all sides there were evidences of the fear and panic that had stricken not only the populace, but the official classes. Calamities from all sides were apparently closing in on the country. Up to January 1, 1915, Turkey had done nothing to justify her participation in the war. On the contrary, she had met defeat practically everywhere. Jemal, as already recorded, had left Constantinople as the prospective conqueror of Egypt, but his expedition had proved to be a bloody and humiliating failure. Enver's attempt to redeem the Caucasus from Russian rule had resulted in an even more frightful military disaster. He had ignored the advice of the Germans, which was to let the Russians advance to Sivas and make his stand there and, instead, he had boldly attempted to gain Russian territory in the Caucasus. This army had been defeated at every point, but the military reverses did not end its sufferings. The Turks had a most inadequate medical and sanitary service. Typhus and dysentery broke out in all the camps, the deaths from these diseases reaching a hundred thousand men. Dreadful stories were constantly coming in, telling of the sufferings of these soldiers. That England was preparing for an invasion of Mesopotamia was well known, and no one at that time had any reason to believe that it would not succeed. Every day the Turks expected the news that the Bulgarians had declared war and were marching on Constantinople, and they knew that such an attack would necessarily bring in Romania and Greece. It was no diplomatic secret that Italy was waiting only for the arrival of warm weather to join the Allies. At this moment the Russian fleet was bombarding Trebizond on the Black Sea, and was daily expected at the entrance to the Bosporus. Meanwhile the domestic situation was deplorable. All over Turkey thousands of the populace were daily dying of starvation. Practically all able-bodied men had been taken into the army so that only a few were left to till the fields. The criminal requisitions had almost destroyed all business. The treasury was in a more exhausted state than normally, for the closing of the Dardanelles and the blockading of the Mediterranean ports had stopped all imports and customs dues, and the increasing wrath of the people seemed likely any day to break out against Talat and his associates. And now, surrounded by increasing troubles on every hand, the Turks learned that this mighty armada of England and her allies was approaching, determined to destroy the defences and capture the city. At that time there was no force which the Turks feared so greatly as they feared the British fleet. Its tradition of several centuries of uninterrupted victories had completely seized their imagination. It seemed to them superhuman, the one overwhelming power which it was hopeless to contest. Wangenheim, and also nearly all of the German military and naval forces, not only regarded the forcing of the Dardanelles as possible, but they believed it to be inevitable. The possibility of British success was one of the most familiar topics of discussion, and the weight of opinion, both lay and professional, 
inclined in favor of the Allied fleets. Tollett told me that an attempt to force the Straits would succeed. It only depended on England's willingness to sacrifice a few ships. The real reason why Turkey had sent a force against Egypt, Tollett added, was to divert England from making an attack on the Gallipoli Peninsula. The state of mind that existed is shown by the fact that, on January 1st, the Turkish government had made preparations for two trains, one of which was to take the Sultan and his suite to Asia Minor, while the other was intended for Wangenheim, Palavasini, and the rest of the diplomatic corps. On January 2nd I had an illuminating talk with Palavasini. He showed me a certificate given him by Bedri, the prefect of police, passing him and his secretaries and servants on one of these emergency trains. He also had seat tickets for himself and all of his suite. He said that each train would have only three cars, so that it could make great speed. He had been told to have everything ready to start at an hour's notice. Wangenheim made little attempt to conceal his apprehensions. He told me that he had made all preparations to send his wife to Berlin, and he invited Mrs. Morgenthau to accompany her, so that she, too, could be removed from the danger zone. Wangenheim showed fear, which was then the prevailing one, that a successful bombardment would lead to fires and massacres in Constantinople, as well as in the rest of Turkey. In anticipation of such disturbances, he made a characteristic suggestion. Should the fleet pass the Dardanelles, he said, the life of no Englishman in Turkey would be safe. They would all be massacred. As it was so difficult to tell an Englishman from an American, he proposed that I should give the Americans a distinctive button to wear, which would protect them from Turkish violence. As I was convinced that Wangenheim's real purpose was to arrange some sure means of identifying the English, and of so subjecting them to Turkish ill-treatment, I refused to act on this amiable suggestion. Another incident illustrates the nervous tension which prevailed in those January days. I noticed that some shutters at the British Embassy were open, so Mrs. Morgenthau and I went up to investigate. In the early days we had sealed this building, which had been left in my charge, and this was the first time we had broken the seals to enter. About two hours after we returned from this tour of inspection, Wangenheim came into my office in one of his now familiar agitated moods. It had been reported, he said, that Mrs. Morgenthau and I had been up to the embassy, getting it ready for the British admiral, who expected soon to take possession. All this seems a little absurd now, for, in fact, the Allied fleets made no attack at that time. At the very moment when the whole of Constantinople was feverishly awaiting the British dreadnoughts, the British cabinet in London was merely considering the advisability of such an enterprise. The record shows that Petrograd, on January 2nd, telegraphed the British government, asking that some kind of a demonstration be made against the Turks, who were pressing the Russians in the Caucasus. Though an encouraging reply was immediately sent to this request, it was not until January 28th that the British cabinet definitely issued orders for an attack on the Dardanelles. It is no longer a secret that there was no unanimous confidence in the success of such an undertaking. Admiral Cardin recorded his belief that the strait could not be rushed, but that extended operations with a large number of ships might succeed. The penalty of failure, he added, would be the great loss that England would suffer in prestige and influence in the East. How true this prophecy proved, I shall have occasion to show. Up to this time, one of the fundamental and generally accepted axioms of naval operations had been that warships should not attempt to attack fixed land fortifications. But the Germans had demonstrated the power of mobile guns against fortresses in their destruction of the emplacements at Liège and Namur, and there was a belief in some quarters of England that these events had modified this naval principle. Mr. Churchill, at that time the head of the Admiralty, placed great confidence in the destructive power of a new super-dreadnought which had just been finished, 
the Queen Elizabeth, and which was then on its way to join the Mediterranean fleet. We in Constantinople knew nothing about these deliberations then, but the result became apparent in the latter part of February. On the morning of the 19th, Pallavicini, the Austrian ambassador, came to me with important news. The Marquis was a man of great personal dignity, yet it was apparent that he was this day exceedingly nervous, and, indeed, he made no attempt to conceal his apprehension. The Allied fleets, he said, had reopened their attack on the Dardanelles, and this time their bombardment had been extremely ferocious. At that hour things were going badly for the Austrians. The Russian armies were advancing victoriously. Serbia had hurled the Austrians over the frontier, and the European press was filled with prognostications of the break-up of the Austrian Empire. Pallavicini's attitude this afternoon was a perfect reflection of the dangers that were then encompassing his country. He was a sensitive and proud man, proud of his emperor, and proud of what he regarded as the great Austro-Hungarian Empire. He now appeared to be overburdened by the fear that this extensive Habsburg fabric, which had withstood the assaults of so many centuries, was rapidly being overwhelmed with ruin. Like most human beings, Pallavicini yearned for sympathy. He could obtain none from Wangenheim, who seldom took him into his confidence, and consistently treated him as the representative of a nation that was compelled to submit to the overlordship of Germany. Perhaps that was the reason why the Austrian ambassador used to pour his heart out to me. And now this allied bombardment of the Dardanelles came as the culmination of all his troubles— at this time the Central Powers believed that they had Russia bottled up, that they had sealed the Dardanelles, and that she could neither get her wheat to market nor import the munitions needed for carrying on the war. Germany and Austria thus had a stranglehold on their gigantic foe, and, if this condition could be maintained indefinitely, the collapse of Russia would be inevitable. At present, it is true, the Tsar's forces were making a victorious campaign, and this in itself was sufficiently alarming to Austria, but their present supplies of war materials would ultimately be exhausted, and then their great superiority in men would help them little, and they would inevitably go to pieces. But should Russia get Constantinople, with the control of the Dardanelles and the Bosporus, she could obtain all the munitions needed for warfare on the largest scale, and the defeat of the central powers might immediately follow and such a defeat, Pallavicini well understood, would be far more serious for Austria than for Germany. Wangenheim had told me that it was Germany's plan, in case the Austro-Hungarian Empire disintegrated, to incorporate her twelve million Germans in the Hohenzollern domain, and Pallavicini, of course, was familiar with this danger. The Allied attack on the Dardanelles thus meant to Pallavicini the extinction of his country, for if we are properly to understand his state of mind, we must remember that he firmly believed, as did almost all the other important men in Constantinople, that such an attack would succeed. Wangenheim's existence was made miserable by this same haunting conviction. As I have already shown, the bottling up of Russia was almost exclusively the German ambassador's performance— he had brought the Gerben in the Breslau into Constantinople, and by this manoeuvre had precipitated Turkey into the war. The forcing of the strait would mean more than the transformation of Russia into a permanent and powerful participant in the war. It meant, and this was by no means an unimportant consideration with Wangenheim, the undoing of his great personal achievement. Yet Wangenheim showed his apprehensions quite differently from Pallavicini. In true German fashion, he resorted to threats and bravado. He gave no external signs of depression, but his whole body tingled with rage. He was not deploring his fate, he was looking for ways of striking back. He would sit in my office, smoking with his usual energy, and tell me all the terrible things which he proposed to do to his enemy. The thing that particularly preyed upon Wangenheim's mind was the exposed position of the German embassy. It stood on a high hill, one of the most conspicuous buildings in the town, 
a perfect target for an enterprising English admiral. Almost the first object the British fleet would sight, as it entered the harbor, would be this yellow monument of the Hohenzollerns, and the temptation to shell it might prove irresistible. "'Let them dare destroy my embassy,' Wangenheim said. "'I'll get even with them. If they fire a single shot at it, we'll blow up the French and English embassies. Go tell the Admiral that, won't you? Tell him also that we have the dynamite all ready to do it.' Wangenheim also showed great anxiety over the proposed removal of the government to Eski Cher. In early January, when every one was expecting the arrival of the Allied fleet, preparations had been made for moving the government to Asia Minor, and now, at the first rumbling of the British and French guns, the special trains were prepared once more. Wangenheim and Palvasini both told me of their unwillingness to accompany the Sultan and the government to Asia Minor. Should the Allies capture Constantinople, the ambassadors of the Central Powers would find themselves cut off from their home countries, and completely in the hands of the Turks. The Turks could then hold us as hostages, said Wangenheim. They urged Talat to establish the emergency government at Adrianople, from which town they could motor in and out of Constantinople, and then, in case the city were captured, they could make their escape home. The Turks, on the other hand, refused to adopt this suggestion, because they feared an attack from Bulgaria. Wangenheim and Palavasini now found themselves between two fires. If they stayed in Constantinople, they might become prisoners of the English and French. On the other hand, if they went to Eski Cher, it was not unlikely that they would become prisoners of the Turks. Many evidences of the flimsy basis on which rested the Germano-Turkish alliance had come to my attention, but this was about the most illuminating. Wangenheim knew, as did everybody else, that, in case the French and English captured Constantinople, the Turks would vent their rage not mainly against the Entente, but against the Germans who had enticed them into the war. It all seems so strange now, this conviction that was uppermost in the minds of everybody then, that the success of the Allied fleets against the Dardanelles was inevitable, and that the capture of Constantinople was a matter of only a few days. I recall an animated discussion that took place at the American Embassy on the afternoon of February 24th. The occasion was Mrs. Morgenthau's weekly reception, meetings which furnished almost the only opportunity in those days for the foregathering of the diplomats. Practically all were on hand this afternoon. The first great bombardment of the Dardanelles had taken place five days before. This had practically destroyed the fortifications at the mouth of the strait. There was naturally only one subject of discussion. Would the Allied fleets get through? What would happen if they did? Everybody expressed an opinion. Wangenheim, Palavasini, Garoni, the Italian ambassador, Dankasvard, the Swedish minister, Kolachev, the Bulgarian minister, Kuhlmann and Scharfenberg, first secretary of the German embassy, and it was the unanimous opinion that the Allied attack would succeed. I particularly remember Kuhlmann's attitude. He discussed the capture of Constantinople almost as though it was something which had already taken place. The Persian ambassador showed great anxiety. His embassy stood not far from the sublime port. He told me that he feared that the latter building would be bombarded, and that a few stray shots might easily set afire his own residence, and he asked if he might move his archives to the American embassy. The wildest rumors were afloat. We were told that the standard oil agent at the Dardanelles had counted seventeen transports loaded with troops, that the warships had already fired eight hundred shots and had leveled all the hills at the entrance, and that Talat's bodyguard had been shot, the implication being that the bullet had missed its intended victim. It was said that the whole Turkish populace was aflame with the fear that the English and the French, when they reached the city, would celebrate the event by a wholesale attack on Turkish women. The latter reports were, of course, absurd. 
they were merely characteristic rumors set afloat by the Germans and their Turkish associates. The fact is that the great mass of the people in Constantinople were probably praying that the Allied attack would succeed, and so release them from the control of the political gang that then ruled the country. And in all this excitement there was one lonely and despondent figure. This was Talat. Whenever I saw him in those critical days, he was the picture of desolation and defeat. The Turks, like most primitive peoples, wear their emotions on the surface, and with them the transition from exultation to despair is a rapid one. The thunder of the British guns at the Straits apparently spelled doom to Talat. The letter-carrier of Adrianople seemed to have reached the end of his career. He again confided to me his expectation that the English would capture the Turkish capital, and once more he said that he was sorry that Turkey had entered the war. Talat well knew what would happen as soon as the Allied fleet entered the Sea of Marmara. According to the report of the Cromer Commission, Lord Kitchener, in giving his assent to a purely naval expedition, had relied upon a revolution in Turkey to make the enterprise successful. Lord Kitchener has been much criticized for his part in the Dardanelles attack. I owe it to his memory, however, to say that on this point he was absolutely right. Had the Allied fleets once passed the defences at the Straits, the administration of the young Turks would have come to a bloody end. As soon as the guns began to fire, placards appeared on the hoardings, denouncing Talat and his associates as responsible for all the woes that had come to Turkey. Bedri, the prefect of police, was busy collecting all the unemployed young men and sending them out of the city. His purpose was to free Constantinople of all who might start a revolution against the young Turks. It was a common report that Bedri feared this revolution much more than he feared the British fleet. And this was the same nemesis that was every moment now pursuing Talat. A single episode illustrates the nervous excitement that prevailed. Dr. Lederer, the correspondent of the Berliner Tageblatt, made a short visit to the Dardanelles, and, on his return, reported to certain ladies of the diplomatic circle that the German officers had told them that they were wearing their shrouds, as they expected any minute to be buried there. This statement went around the city like wildfire, and Dr. Lederer was threatened with arrest for making it. He appealed to me for help. I took him to Wangenheim, who refused to have anything to do with him. Lederer, he said, was an Austrian subject, although he represented a German newspaper. His anger at Lederer for this indiscretion was extreme. But I finally succeeded in getting the unpopular journalist into the Austrian embassy, where he was harbored for the night. In a few days Lederer had to leave town. In the midst of all this excitement there was one person who was apparently not at all disturbed. Though ambassadors, generals, and politicians might anticipate the worst calamities, Enver's voice was reassuring and quiet. The man's coolness and really courageous spirit never shone to better advantage. In late December and January, when the city had its first fright over the bombardment, Enver was fighting the Russians in the Caucasus. His experiences in this campaign, as already described, had been far from glorious. Enver had left Constantinople in November to join his army, an expectant conqueror. He returned in the latter part of January, the commander of a thoroughly beaten and demoralized force. Such a disastrous experience would have utterly ruined almost any other military leader, and that Enver felt his reverses keenly was evident from the way in which he kept himself from public view. I had my first glimpse of him, after his return, at a concert given for the benefit of the Red Crescent. At this affair Enver sat far back in a box, as though he intended to keep as much as possible out of sight. It was quite apparent that he was uncertain as to the cordiality of his reception by the public. All the important people in Constantinople, the Crown Prince, the members of the Cabinet, and the ambassadors attended this function, and, in accordance with the usual custom, the Crown Prince sent for these dignitaries, one after another, 
for a few words of greeting and congratulation. After that, the visiting from box to box became general. The heir to the throne sent for Enver as well as the rest, and this recognition evidently gave him new courage, for he began to mingle with the diplomats, who also treated him with the utmost cordiality and courtesy. Enver apparently regarded this favorable notice as having re-established his standing, and now once more he assumed a leading part in the crisis. A few days afterward he discussed the situation with me. He was much astonished, he said, at the fear that so generally prevailed, and he was disgusted at the preparations that had been made to send away the sultan and the government, and practically leave the city a prey to the English. He did not believe that the Allied fleets could force the Dardanelles. He had recently inspected all the fortifications, and he had every confidence in their ability to resist successfully. Even though the ships did get through, he insisted that Constantinople should be defended to the last man. Yet Enver's assurance did not satisfy his associates. They had made all their arrangements for the British fleet. If, in spite of the most heroic resistance the Turkish armies could make, it still seemed likely that the Allies were about to capture the city, the ruling powers had their final plans all prepared. They proposed to do to this great capital precisely what the Russians had done to Moscow when Napoleon appeared before it. They will never capture an existing city, they told me, only a heap of ashes. As a matter of fact, this was no idle threat. I was told that cans of petroleum had been already stored in all the police stations and other places, ready to fire the town at a moment's notice. As Constantinople is built largely of wood, this would have been no very difficult task. But they were determined to destroy more than these temporary structures. The plans aimed at the beautiful architectural monuments built by the Christians long before the Turkish occupation. The Turks had particularly marked for dynamiting the Mosque of St. Sophia. This building, which had been a Christian church centuries before it became a Mohammedan mosque, is one of the most magnificent structures of the vanished Byzantine Empire. Naturally, the suggestion of such an act of vandalism aroused us all, and I made a plea to Talat that St. Sophia should be spared. He treated the proposed destruction lightly. There are not six men in the Committee of Union and Progress, he told me, who care for anything that is old. We all like new things. That was all the satisfaction I obtained in this matter at that time. Enver's insistence that the Dardanelles could resist caused his associates to lose confidence in his judgment. About a year afterward, Bedri Bey, the prefect of police, gave me additional details. While Enver was still in the Caucasus, Bedri said Talat had called a conference, a kind of council of war, on the Dardanelles. This had been attended by Lehman von Zanders, the German general who had reorganized the Turkish army. Usedom, the German admiral who was the inspector general of the Ottoman coast defenses, Bronsart, the German chief of staff of the Turkish army, and several others. Every man present gave it as his opinion that the British and French fleets could force the straits. The only subject of dispute, said Bedri, was whether it would take the ships eight or twenty hours to reach Constantinople after they had destroyed the defenses. Enver's position was well understood, but this council decided to ignore him, and to make the preparations without his knowledge, to eliminate the Minister of War, at least temporarily, from their deliberations. In early March, Bedri and Jambolat, who was Director of Public Safety, came to see me. At that time the exodus from the capital had begun. Turkish women and children were being moved to the interior. All the banks had been compelled to send their gold into Asia Minor. The archives of the sublime port had already been carried to Eski Sher, and practically all the ambassadors and their suites, as well as most of the government officials, had made their preparations to leave. The director of the museum, who was one of the six Turks to whom Talat had referred as liking old things, had buried many of Constantinople's finest works of art in cellars, 
or covered them for protection. Bedri came to arrange the details of my departure. As ambassador I was personally accredited to the Sultan, and it would obviously be my duty, said Bedri, to go wherever the Sultan went. The train was all ready, he added. He wished to know how many people I intended to take, so that sufficient space could be reserved. To this proposal I entered a flat refusal. I informed Bedri that I thought that my responsibilities made it necessary for me to remain in Constantinople. Only a neutral ambassador, I said, could forestall massacres and the destruction of the city, and certainly I owed it to the civilized world to prevent, if I could, such calamities as these. If my position as ambassador made it inevitable that I should follow the Sultan, I would resign and become honorary consul-general. Both Bedri and Jambalat were much younger and less experienced men than I, and I therefore told them that they needed a man of maturer years to advise them in an international crisis of this kind. I was not only interested in protecting foreigners and American institutions, but I was also interested, on general humanitarian grounds, in safeguarding the Turkish population from the excesses that were generally expected. The several nationalities, many of them containing elements which were given to pillage and massacre, were causing great anxiety. I therefore proposed to Bedri and Jambalat that the three of us form a kind of committee to take control in the approaching crisis. They consented, and the three of us sat down and decided on a course of action. We took a map of Constantinople, and marked the districts which, under the existing rules of warfare, we agreed that the Allied fleet would have the right to bombard. Thus we decided that the War Office, Marine Office, Telegraph Offices, Railroad Stations, and all public buildings could quite legitimately be made targets for their guns. Then we marked out certain zones which we should insist on regarding as immune. The main residential section, and the part where all the embassies are located, is Para, the district on the north shore of the Golden Horn. This we marked as not subject to attack. We also delimited certain residential areas of Stambul and Galata, the Turkish sections. I telegraphed to Washington, asking the State Department to obtain a ratification of these plans, and an agreement to respect these zones of safety from the British and French governments. I received a reply endorsing my action. All preparations had thus been made. At the station stood the trains which were to take the Sultan and the government and the ambassadors to Asia Minor. They had steam up, ready to move at a minute's notice. We were all awaiting the triumphant arrival of the Allied fleet. End of chapter 16《ジャプター17》の「アンバサダー・モーゲンタウ・ストーリー」、ヘンリー・モーゲンタウ。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Enver, as the man who demonstrated the vulnerability of the British fleet, old fashioned defenses of the Dardanelles. When the situation had reached this exciting stage, Enver asked me to visit the Dardanelles. He still insisted that the fortifications were impregnable. And he could not understand, he said, the panic which was then raging in Constantinople. He had visited the Dardanelles himself, had inspected every gun and every emplacement, and he was entirely confident that his soldiers could hold off the Allied fleet indefinitely. He had taken Talat down, and by doing so he had considerably eased that statesman's fears. It was Enver's conviction that, if I should visit the fortifications, I would be persuaded that the fleets could never get through, and that I would thus be able to give such assurances to the people that the prevailing excitement would subside. I disregarded certain natural doubts as to whether an ambassador should expose himself to the dangers of such a situation. The ships were bombarding nearly every day, and promptly accepted Enver's invitation. On the morning of the 15th, we left Constantinople on the Uruk. Enver himself accompanied us as far as Panderma, 
an Asiatic town on the Sea of Marmara. The party included several other notables, Ibrahim Bey, the Minister of Justice, Husni Pasha, the general who had commanded the army which had deposed Abdul Hamid in the Young Turk Revolution, and Senator Cherif Jafar Pasha, an Arab and a direct descendant of the Prophet. A particularly congenial companion was Fuad Pasha, an old field marshal, who had led an adventurous career. Despite his age, he had an immense capacity for enjoyment, was a huge feeder and a capacious drinker, and had as many stories to tell of exile, battle, and hair-breadth escapes as Othello. All of these men were much older than Enver, and all of them were descended from far more distinguished ancestors, yet they treated this stripling with the utmost deference. Enver seemed particularly glad of this opportunity to discuss the situation. Immediately after breakfast he took me aside, and together we went up to the deck. The day was a beautiful sunny one, and the sky in the Marmara was that deep blue which we find only in this part of the world. What most impressed me was the intense quiet, the almost desolate inactivity of these silent waters. Our ship was almost the only one in sight, and this inland sea, which in ordinary times was one of the world's greatest commercial highways, was now practically a primeval waste. The whole scene was merely a reflection of the great triumph which German diplomacy had accomplished in the Near East. For nearly six months not a Russian merchant ship had passed through the straits. All the commerce of Romania and Bulgaria, which had normally found its way to Europe across this inland sea, had long since disappeared. The ultimate significance of all this desolation was that Russia was blockaded and completely isolated from her allies. How much that one fact has meant in the history of the world for the last three years! And now England and France were seeking to overcome this disadvantage, to link up their own military resources with those of their great eastern ally, and to restore the Dardanelles and the Marmara, the thousands of ships that meant Russia's existence as a military and economic and even, as subsequent events have shown, as a political power. We were approaching the scene of one of the great crises of the war. Would England and her allies succeed in this enterprise? Would their ships at the Dardanelles smash the fortifications, break through, and again make Russia a permanent force in the war? That was the main subject which Enver and I discussed, as for nearly three hours we walked up and down the deck. Enver again referred to the silly panic that had seized nearly all classes in the capital. "'Even though Bulgaria and Greece both turn against us,' he said, "'we shall defend Constantinople to the end. We have plenty of guns, plenty of ammunition, and we have these on terra firma, whereas the English and French batteries are on floating ones. And the natural advantages of the straits are so great that the warships can make little progress against them.' I do not care what other people may think. I have studied this problem more thoroughly than any of them, and I feel that I am right. As long as I am the head of the War Department, we shall not give up. Indeed, I do not know just what these English and French battleships are driving at. Suppose that they rush the Dardanelles, get into the Marmara, and reach Constantinople. What good will that do them? They can bombard and destroy the city, I admit, but they cannot capture it, as they have only a few troops to land. Unless they do bring a large army, they will really be caught in a trap. They can perhaps stay here for two or three weeks until their food and supplies are all exhausted, and then they will have to go back, rush the straits again, and again run the risk of annihilation. In the meantime we would have repaired the forts, brought in troops, and made ourselves ready for them. It seems to me to be a very foolish enterprise. I have already told how Enver had taken Napoleon as his model, and in this Dardanelles expedition he now apparently saw a Napoleonic opportunity. As we were pacing the deck he stopped a moment, looked at me earnestly, and said, 
I shall go down in history as the man who demonstrated the vulnerability of England and her fleet. I shall show that her navy is not invincible. I was in England a few years before the war, and discussed England's position with many of her leading men, such as Asquith, Churchill, Haldane. I told them that their course was wrong. Winston Churchill declared that England could defend herself with her navy alone, and that she needed no large army. I told Churchill that no great empire could last that did not have both an army and a navy. I found that Churchill's opinion was the one that prevailed everywhere in England. There was only one man I met who agreed with me. That was Lord Roberts. Well, Churchill has now sent his fleet down here, perhaps to show me that his navy can do all that he said it could do. Now we'll see." Enver seemed to regard this naval expedition as a personal challenge from Mr. Churchill to himself, almost like a continuation of their argument in London. "'You too should have a large army,' said Enver, referring to the United States. "'I do not believe,' he went on, "'that England is trying to force the Dardanelles because Russia has asked her to. When I was in England, I discussed with Churchill the possibility of a general war.' He asked me what Turkey would do in such a case, and said that, if we took Germany's side, the British fleet would force the Dardanelles and capture Constantinople. Churchill is not trying to help Russia. He is carrying out the threat made to me at that time. Enver spoke with the utmost determination and conviction. He said that nearly all the damage inflicted on the outside forts had been repaired, and that the Turks had methods of defense, the existence of which the enemy little suspected. He showed great bitterness against the English. He accused them of attempting to bribe Turkish officials, and even said that they had instigated attempts upon his own life. On the other hand, he displayed no particular friendliness toward the Germans. Wangenheim's overbearing manners had caused him much irritation, and the Turks, he said, got on none too well with the German officers. The Turks and the Germans, he added, care nothing for each other. We are with them because it is our interest to be with them. They are with us because that is their interest. Germany will back Turkey just so long as that helps Germany. Turkey will back Germany just so long as that helps Turkey. Enver seemed much impressed at the close of our interview with the intimate personal relations which we had established with each other. He apparently believed that he, the great Enver, the Napoleon of the Turkish Revolution, had unbended in discussing his nation's affair with a mere ambassador. "'You know,' he said, "'that there is no one in Germany with whom the Emperor talks as intimately as I have talked with you to-day.' We reached Panderma about two o'clock. Here Enver and his auto were put ashore, and our party started again, our boat arriving at Gallipoli late in the afternoon. We anchored in the harbor, and spent the night on board. All the evening we could hear the guns bombarding the fortifications, but these reminders of war and death did not affect the spirits of my Turkish hosts. The occasion was for them a great lark. They had spent several months in hard, exacting work, and now they behaved like boys suddenly let out for vacation. They cracked jokes, told stories, sang the queerest kinds of songs, and played childish pranks upon one another. The venerable Fouad, despite his nearly ninety years, developed great qualities as an entertainer, and the fact that his associates made him the butt of most of their horseplay apparently only added to his enjoyment of the occasion. The amusement reached its height when one of his friends surreptitiously poured him a glass of eau de cologne. The old gentleman looked at the new drink a moment, and then diluted it with water. I was told that the proper way of testing Rocky, the popular Turkish tipple, is by mixing it with water. If it turns white under this treatment, it is the real thing, and may be safely drunk. Apparently water has the same effect on eau de cologne, for the contents of Fouad's glass, after this test, turned white. The old gentleman, therefore, poured the whole thing down his throat without a grimace, much to the hilarious entertainment of his tormentors. In the morning we started again. 
We now had fairly arrived in the Dardanelles, and from Gallipoli we had a sail of nearly twenty-five miles to Chanak Kale. For the most part this section of the strait is uninteresting, and from a military point of view it is unimportant. The stream is about two miles wide, both sides are low-lying and marshy, and only a few scrambling villages show any signs of life. I was told that there were a few ancient fortifications, their rusty guns pointing toward the Marmara, the emplacements having been erected there in the early part of the nineteenth century for the purpose of preventing hostile ships entering from the north. These fortifications, however, were so inconspicuous that I could not see them. My hosts informed me that they had no fighting power, and that, indeed, there was nothing in the northern part of the straits, from Point Nagara to the Marmara, that could offer resistance to any modern fleet. The chief interest which I found in this part of the Dardanelles was purely historic and legendary. The ancient town of Lampsacus appeared in the modern Lapsaki, just across from Gallipoli, and Nagara Point is the site of ancient Abydos, from which village Leander used to swim nightly across the Hellespont to Hero, a feat of which was repeated about one hundred years ago by Lord Byron. Here also Xerxes crossed from Asia to Greece on a bridge of boats, embarking on that famous expedition which was to make him master of mankind. The spirit of Xerxes, I thought, as I passed the scene of his exploit, is still quite active in the world. The Germans and the Turks had found a less romantic use for this, the narrowest part of the Dardanelles, for here they had stretched a cable and anti-submarine barrage of mines and nets, a device which, as I shall describe, did not keep the English and French underwater boats out of the Marmara and the Bosporus. It was not until we rounded this historic point of Nagara that the dull monotony of flat shores gave place to a more diversified landscape. On the European side the cliffs now began to descend precipitously to the water, reminding me of our own palisades along the Hudson, and I obtained glimpses of the hills and mountain ridges that afterward proved such tragical stumbling-blocks to the valiant allied armies. The configuration of the land south of Nagara, with its many hills and ridges, made it plain why the military engineers had selected this stretch of the Dardanelles as the section best adapted to defense. Our boat was now approaching what was perhaps the most commanding point in the whole strait, the city Chanak, or, to give its modern European name, Dardanelles. In normal times this was a thriving port of sixteen thousand people, its houses built of wood, the headquarters of a considerable trade in wool and other products, and for centuries it had been an important military station. Now, excepting for the soldiers, it was deserted, the large civilian population having been moved into Anatolia. The British fleet, we were told, had bombarded this city, yet this statement seemed hardly probable, for I saw only a single house that had been hit, evidently by a stray shell which had been aimed at the nearby fortifications. Djevad Pasha, the Turkish commander-in-chief at the Dardanelles, met us and escorted our party to headquarters. Djevad was a man of culture and of pleasing and cordial manners. As he spoke excellent German, I had no need of an interpreter. I was much impressed by the deference with which the German officers treated him, that he was the commander-in-chief in this theatre of war, and that the generals of the Kaiser were his subordinates, was made plainly apparent. As we passed into his office, Djevad stopped in front of a piece of a torpedo, mounted in the middle of the hall, evidently as a souvenir. "'There is the great criminal,' he said, calling my attention to the relic. About this time the newspapers were hailing the exploit of an English submarine, which had sailed from England to the Dardanelles, passed under the minefield, and torpedoed the Turkish warship Mesudye. "'That's the torpedo that did it,' said Djevad. "'You'll see the wreck of the ship when you go down.' The first fortification I visited was that of Anadolu Hamidye, 
that is, Asiatic Hamidie, located on the water's edge just outside of Tianak. My first impression was that I was in Germany. The officers were practically all Germans, and everywhere Germans were building buttresses with sacks of sand, and in other ways strengthening the emplacements. Here German, not Turkish, was the language heard on every side. Colonel Verla, who conducted me over these batteries, took the greatest delight in showing them. He had the simple pride of the artist in his work, and told me of the happiness that had come into his days when Germany had at last found herself at war. All his life, he said, he had spent in military practices, and, like most Germans, he had become tired of maneuvers, sham battles, and other forms of mimic hostilities. Yet he was approaching fifty, he had become a colonel, and he was fearful that his career would close without actual military experience. And then the splendid thing had happened, and here he was, fighting a real English enemy, firing real guns and shells. There was nothing brutal about Verla's manners. He was a gemütlich gentleman from Baden, and thoroughly likable, yet he was all aglow with the spirit of der Tag. His attitude was simply that of a man who had spent his lifetime learning a trade, and who now rejoiced at the chance of exercising it. But he furnished an illuminating light on the German military character, and the forces that had really caused the war. Feeling myself so completely in German country, I asked Colonel Verla why there were so few Turks on this side of the strait. "'You won't ask me that question this afternoon,' he said, smiling, "'when you go over to the other side.' The location of Anadolu Hamidie seemed ideal. It stands right at the water's edge, and consists, or it did then, of ten guns, every one completely sweeping the Dardanelles. Walking upon the parapet, I had a clear view of the strait, and Cum Kale at the entrance, about fifteen miles away, stood out conspicuously. No warship could enter these waters without immediately coming within complete sight of her gunners. Yet the fortress itself, to an unprofessional eye like my own, was not particularly impressive. The parapet and traverses were merely mounds of earth, and stand to-day practically as they were finished by their French constructors in 1837. There is a general belief that the Germans had completely modernized the Dardanelles' defenses, but this was not true at that time. The guns defending Fort Anadolu Hamidie were more than thirty years old, all being the Krupp model of 1885, and the rusted exteriors of some of them gave evidences of their age. Their extreme range was only about nine miles, while the range of the battleships opposing them was about ten miles, and that of the Queen Elizabeth was not far from eleven. The figures which I have given for Anadolu Hamidie apply also to practically all the guns at the other effective fortifications. So far as the advantage of rain was concerned, therefore, the Allied fleet had a decided superiority, the Queen Elizabeth alone having them all practically at her mercy. Nor did the fortifications contain very considerable supplies of ammunition. At that time, the European and American papers were printing stories that trainloads of shells and guns were coming by way of Romania from Germany to the Dardanelles. From facts which I had learned on this trip, and subsequently, I am convinced that these reports were pure fiction. A small number of redheads, that is, non-armor-piercing projectiles, useful only for fighting landing parties, had been brought from Adrianople, and were reposing in Hamidie at the time of my visit, but these were small in quantity, and of no value in fighting ships. I lay this stress upon Hamidie, because this was the most important fortification in the Dardanelles. Throughout the whole bombardment it attracted more of the Allied fire than any other position, and it inflicted at least sixty per cent of all the damage that was done to the attacking ships. It was Anadolu Hamidie which, in the great bombardment of March 18th, sank the Bouvet, the French battleship, and which in the course of the whole attack disabled several other units. 
All its officers were Germans, and eighty-five percent of the men on duty came from the crews of the Gerben and the Breslau. Getting into the automobile, we sped along the military road to Dardanos, passing on the way the wreck of the Mesudier. The Dardanos battery was as completely Turkish as the Hamidier was German. The guns at Dardanos were somewhat more modern than those at Hamidier. They were the Krupp model of 1905. Here also was stationed the only new battery which the Germans had established up to the time of my visit. It consisted of several guns which they had taken from the German and Turkish warships then lying in the Bosporus. A few days before our inspection the Allied fleet had entered the Bay of Erankoy and had submitted Dardanos to a terrific bombardment, the evidences of which I saw on every hand. The land for nearly half a mile about seemed to have been completely churned up. It looked like photographs I had seen of the battlefields in France. The strange thing was that, despite all this punishment, the batteries themselves remained intact. Not a single gun, my guides told me, had been destroyed. "'After the war is over,' said General Mertens, "'we are going to establish a big tourist resort here, build a hotel, and sell relics to you Americans.' We shall not have to do much excavating to find them. The British fleet is doing that for us now. This sounded like a passing joke, yet the statement was literally true. Dardanos, where this emplacement is located, was one of the famous cities of the ancient world. In Homeric times it was part of the principality of Priam. Fragments of capitals and columns are still visible, and the shells from the Allied fleet were now ploughing up many relics which had been buried for thousands of years. One of my friends picked up a water-jug which had perhaps been used in the days of Troy. The effectiveness of modern gunfire in excavating these evidences of a long-lost civilization was striking, though, unfortunately, the relics did not always come to the surface intact. The Turkish generals were extremely proud of the fight which this Dardanos battery had made against the British ships. They would lead me to the guns that had done particularly good service, and pat them affectionately. For my benefit, Djevad called out Lieutenant Hassan, the Turkish officer who had defended this position. He was a little fellow, with jet-black hair, black eyes, extremely modest, and almost shrinking in the presence of these great generals. Djevad patted Hassan on both cheeks, while another high Turkish officer stroked his hair. One would have thought that he was a faithful dog who had just performed some meritorious service. "'It's men like you, of whom great heroes are made,' said General Djevad. He asked Hassan to describe the attack and the way it had been met. The embarrassed lieutenant quietly told his story, though he was moved almost to tears by the appreciation of his exalted chiefs. "'There is a great future for you in the army,' said General Jevad, as we parted from this hero. Poor Hassan's future came two days afterward, when the Allied fleet made its greatest attack. One of the shells struck his dugout, which caved in, killing the young man." Yet his behavior on the day I visited his battery showed that he regarded the praise of his general as sufficient compensation for all that he had suffered, or all that he might suffer. I was much puzzled by the fact that the Allied fleet, despite its large expenditures of ammunition, had not been able to hit the Stardanos emplacement. I naturally thought at first that such a failure indicated poor marksmanship, but my German guides said that this was not the case. All this misfire merely illustrated once more the familiar fact that a rapidly maneuvering battleship is under a great disadvantage in shooting at a fixed fortification. But there was another point involved in the Dardanos battery. My hosts called my attention to its location. It was perched on top of the hill, in full view of the ships, forming itself a part of the skyline. Dardanos was merely five steel turrets, each armed with a gun, approached by a winding trench. That, they said, is the most difficult thing in the world to hit. It is so distinct that it looks easy, but the whole thing is an illusion. 
I do not understand completely the optics of the situation, but it seems that the skyline creates a kind of mirage, so that it is practically impossible to hit anything at that point except by accident. The gunner might get what was apparently a perfect sight, yet his shell would go wild. The record of Dardanos had been little short of marvelous. Up to March 18th, the ships had fired at it about four thousand shells. One turret had been hit by a splinter, which had also scratched the paint. Another had been hit and slightly bent in, and another had been hit near the base, and a piece about the size of a man's hand had been knocked out. But not a single gun had been even slightly damaged. Eight men had been killed, including Lieutenant Hassan, and about forty had been wounded. That was the extent of the destruction. It was the optical illusion that saved Dardanos, one of the Germans remarked. End of chapter 17chapter 18 of ambassador morgenthau's story by henry morgenthau this librivox recording is in the public domain the allied armada sails away though on the brink of victory again getting into the automobile we rode along the shore my host calling my attention to the mine fields which stretched from chanak southward about 7 miles in this area the Germans and Turks had scattered nearly four hundred mines. They told me, with a good deal of gusto, that the Russians had furnished a considerable number of these destructive engines. Day after day, Russian destroyers sowed mines at the Black Sea entrance to the Bosporus, hoping that they would float downstream and fulfill their appointed task. Every morning Turkish and German mine sweepers would go up, fish out these mines, and place them in the Dardanelles. The battery at Erinkoy had also been subjected to a heavy bombardment, but it had suffered little. Unlike Dardanos, it was situated back of a hill, completely shut out from view. In order to fortify this spot, I was told, the Turks had been compelled practically to dismantle the fortifications of the inner straits, that section of the stream which extends from Chanak to Point Nagara. This was the reason why this latter part of the Dardanelles was practically unfortified. The guns that had been moved for this purpose were old-style croup pieces of the model of 1885. South of Erinkoy, on the hills bordering the road, the Germans had introduced an innovation. They had found several Krupp howitzers left over from the Bulgarian War, and had installed them on concrete foundations. Each battery had four or five of these emplacements, so that, as I approached them, I found several substantial bases that apparently had no guns. I was mystified further at the sight of a herd of buffaloes. I think I counted sixteen engaged in the operation, hauling one of these howitzers from one emplacement to another. This, it seems, was part of the plan of defense. As soon as the dropping shells indicated that the fleet had obtained the range, the howitzer would be moved, with the aid of the buffalo teams, to another concrete emplacement. "'We have even a better trick than that,' remarked one of the officers." They called out a sergeant, and recounted his achievement. This soldier was the custodian of a contraption which, at a distance, looked like a real gun, but which, when I examined it near at hand, was apparently an elongated section of a sewer pipe. Back of a hill, entirely hidden from the fleet, with which this sergeant had cooperated. The two were connected by telephone. When the command came to fire, the gunner in charge of the howitzer would discharge his shell, while the man in charge of the sewer pipe would burn several pounds of black powder and send forth a conspicuous cloud of inky smoke. Not unnaturally, the Englishmen and Frenchmen on the ships would assume that the shells speeding in their direction came from the visible smoke cloud and would proceed to center all their attention upon that spot. The space around this burlesque gun was pock-marked with shell holes, 
the sergeant in charge, I was told, had attracted more than five hundred shots, while the real artillery piece still remained intact and undetected. From Erenkoy we motored back to General Djevad's headquarters, where we had lunch. Djevad took me up to an observation post, and there before my eyes I had the beautiful blue expanse of the Aegean. I could see the entrances to the Dardanelles, Sed Ulbar, and Kum Kale, standing like the guardians of a gateway, with the rippling sunny waters stretching between. Far out I saw the majestic ships of England and France sailing across the entrance, and still farther away I caught glimpse of the island of Tenedos, behind which we knew that a still larger fleet lay concealed. Naturally this prospect brought to mind a thousand historic and legendary associations, for there is probably no single spot in the world more crowded with poetry and romance. Evidently my Turkish escort, General Djevad, felt the spell, for he took a telescope and pointed at a bleak expanse perhaps six miles away. "'Look at that spot,' he said, handing me the glass. "'Do you know what that is?' I looked, but could not identify this sandy beach. "'Those are the plains of Troy,' he said, "'and the river that you see winding in and out,' he added, "'we Turks call it the Mendere, but Romer knew it as the Scamander. "'Back of us, only a few miles distant, is Mount Ida.' Then he turned his glass out to sea, swept the field where the British ships lay, and again asked me to look at an indicated spot. I immediately brought within view a magnificent English warship, all stripped for battle, quietly steaming along like a man walking on patrol duty. "'That,' said General Djevad, "'is the Agamemnon. Shall I fire a shot at her?' he asked me. "'Yes, if you promise me not to hit her,' I answered." We lunched at headquarters, where we were joined by Admiral Usedom, General Mertens, and General Pomienkowski, the Austrian military attaché at Constantinople. The chief note in the conversation was one of absolute confidence in the future. Whatever the diplomats and politicians in Constantinople may have thought, these men, Turks and Germans, had no expectation, at least their conversation betrayed none, that the Allied fleets would pass their defences. What they seemed to hope for, above everything, was that their enemies would make another attack. "'If we could only get a chance at the Queen Elizabeth,' said one eager German, referring to the greatest ship in the British Navy, then lying off the entrance. As the Rhine wine began to disappear, their eagerness for the combat increased." "'If the damn fools would only make a landing!' exclaimed one. I quote his exact words. The Turkish and German officers, indeed, seemed to vie with each other in expressing their readiness for the fray. Probably a good deal of this was bravado, intended for my consumption. Indeed, I had private information that their exact estimate of the situation was much less reassuring. Now, however, they declared that the war had presented no real opportunity for the German and English navies to measure swords, and for this reason the Germans at the Dardanelles welcomed this chance to try the issue. Having visited all the important places on the Anatolian side, we took a launch and sailed over to the Gallipoli Peninsula. We almost had a disastrous experience on this trip. As we approached the Gallipoli shore, our helmsman was asked if he knew the location of the minefield, and if he could steer through the channel. He said yes, and then steered directly for the mines. Fortunately, the other men noticed the mistake in time, and so we arrived safely at Kilid ul Bar. The batteries here were of about the same character as those on the other side. They formed one of the main defenses of the straits. Here everything, so far as a layman could judge, was in excellent condition, barring the fact that the artillery pieces were of old design, and the ammunition not at all plentiful. The batteries showed signs of a heavy bombardment. None had been destroyed, 
but shell-holes surrounded the fortifications. My Turkish and German escorts looked at these evidences of destruction rather seriously, and they were outspoken in their admiration for the accuracy of the Allied fire. How do they ever get the range? This was the question they were asking each other. What made the shooting so remarkable was the fact that it came not from the Allied ships in the Straits, but from ships stationed in the Aegean Sea on the other side of the Gallipoli Peninsula. The gunners had never seen their target, but had had to fire at a distance of nearly ten miles over high hills, and yet many of their shells had barely missed the batteries at Kilid ul -Bar. When I was there, however, the place was quiet, for no fighting was going on that day. For my particular benefit, the officers put one of their gun crews through a drill, so that I could obtain a perfect picture of the behavior of the Turks in action. In their mind's eye, these artillerists now saw the English ships advancing within range, all their guns pointed to destroy the followers of the Prophet. The bugleman blew his horn, and the whole company rushed to their appointed places. Some were bringing shells, others were opening the breaches, others were taking the ranges, others were straining at pulleys, and others were putting the charges into place. Everything was eagerness and activity. Evidently the Germans had been excellent instructors, but there was more to it than German military precision, for the men's faces lighted up with all that fanaticism which supplies the morale of Turkish soldiers. These gunners momentarily imagined that they were shooting once more at the infidel English, and the exercise was a congenial one. Above the shouts of all I could hear the sing-song chant of the leader, intoning the prayer with which the Muslim has rushed to battle for thirteen centuries. Allah is great, there is but one God, and Mohammed is his prophet. When I looked upon these frenzied men, and saw so plainly written in their faces their uncontrollable hatred of the unbeliever, I called to mind what the Germans had said in the morning about the wisdom of not putting Turkish and German soldiers together. I am quite sure that, had this been done, here at least the holy war would have proved a success, and that the Turks would have vented their hatred of Christians on those who happened to be nearest at hand, for the moment overlooking the fact that they were allies. I returned to Constantinople that evening, and two days afterward, on March 18th, the Allied fleet made its greatest attack. As all the world knows, that attack proved disastrous to the Allies. The outcome was the sinking of the Bouvet, the Ocean, and the Irresistible, and the serious crippling of four other vessels. Of the sixteen ships engaged in this battle on the 18th, seven were thus put temporarily or permanently out of action. Naturally, the Germans and Turks rejoiced over this victory. The police went around, and ordered each householder to display a prescribed number of flags in honor of the event. The Turkish people have so little spontaneous patriotism or enthusiasm of any kind that they would never decorate their establishments without such definite orders. As a matter of fact, neither Germans nor Turks regarded this celebration too seriously, for they were not yet persuaded that they had really won a victory. Most still believed that the Allied fleets would succeed in forcing their way through. The only question, they said, was whether the Entente was ready to sacrifice the necessary number of ships. Neither Wangenheim nor Palavicini believed that the disastrous experience of the 18th would end the naval attack, and for days they anxiously waited for the fleet to return. The high tension lasted for days and weeks after the repulse of the 18th. We were still momentarily expecting the renewal of the attack but the great armada never returned. Should it have come back? Could the Allied ships really have captured Constantinople? I am constantly asked this question. As a layman, my own opinion can have little value, but I have quoted the opinions of the German generals and admirals, and of the Turks, 
practically all of whom, except Enver, believed that the enterprise would succeed, and I am half inclined to believe that Enver's attitude was merely a case of graveyard whistling. In what I now have to say on this point, therefore, I wish it understood that I am giving not my own views, but merely those of the officials then in Turkey, who were best qualified to judge. Enver had told me, in our talk on the deck of the Yuruk, that he had plenty of guns, plenty of ammunition. But this statement was not true. A glimpse at the map will show why Turkey was not receiving munitions from Germany or Austria at that time. The fact was that Turkey was just as completely isolated from her allies then as was Russia. There were two railroad lines leading from Constantinople to Germany. One went by way of Bulgaria and Serbia. Bulgaria was not then an ally. Even though she had winked at the passage of guns and shells, this line could not have been used, since Serbia, which controlled the vital link extending from Nish to Belgrade, was still intact. The other railroad line went through Romania by way of Bucharest. This route was independent of Serbia, and, had the Romanian government consented, it would have formed a clear route from the Krups to the Dardanelles. The fact that munitions could be sent with the connivance of the Romanian government perhaps accounts for the suspicion that guns and shells were going by that route. Day after day the French and British ministers protested at Bucharest against this alleged violation of neutrality, only to be met with angry denials that the Germans were using this line. There is no doubt now that the Romanian government was perfectly honorable in making these denials. It is not unlikely that the Germans themselves started all these stories, merely to fool the Allied fleet into the belief that their supplies were inexhaustible. Let us suppose that the Allies had returned, say on the morning of the 19th, what would have happened? The one overwhelming fact is that the fortifications were very short of ammunition. They had almost reached the limit of their resisting power when the British fleet passed out on the afternoon of the 18th. I had secured permission of Mr. George A. Schreiner, the well-known American correspondent of the Associated Press, to visit the Dardanelles on this occasion. The night of the 18th, this correspondent discussed the situation with General Mertens, who was the chief technical officer at the Straits. General Mertens admitted that the outlook was very discouraging for the defense. "'We expect that the British will come back early tomorrow morning,' he said, "'and if they do, we may be able to hold out for a few hours.' General Mertens did not declare in so many words that the ammunition was practically exhausted, but Mr. Schreiner discovered that such was the case. The fact was that Fort Hamidie, the most powerful defense on the Asiatic side, had just seventeen armor-piercing shells left, while at Kilid ul Bar, which was the main defense on the European side, there were precisely ten. I should advise you to get up at six o'clock tomorrow morning, said General Mertens, and take to the Anatolian hills. That's what we're going to do. The troops at all the fortifications had their orders to man the guns until the last shell had been fired, and then to abandon the forts. Once these defenses became helpless, the problem of the Allied fleet would have been a simple one. The only bar to their progress would have been the minefield, which stretched from a point about two miles north of Arankoy to Khalid ul Bar. But the Allied fleet had plenty of minesweepers, which could have made a channel in a few hours. North of Chanak, as I have already explained, there were a few guns, but they were of the 1878 model, and could not discharge projectiles that could pierce modern armor plate. North of Point Nagara there were only two batteries, and both dated from 1835. Thus, once having silenced the outer straits, there was nothing to bar the passage to Constantinople except the German and Turkish warships. The Gerben was the only first-class fighting ship in either fleet, and it would have not lasted long against the Queen Elizabeth. 
the disproportion in the strength of the opposing fleets indeed was so enormous that it is doubtful whether there would ever have been an engagement thus the allied fleet would have appeared before constantinople on the morning of the twentieth what would have happened then we have heard much discussion as to whether this purely naval attack was justified enver in his conversation with me had laid much stress on the absurdity of sending a fleet to constantinople supported by no adequate landing force and much of the criticism since passed upon the dardanelles expedition has centred on that point yet it is my opinion that this exclusively naval attack was justified i base this judgment purely upon the political situation which then existed in turkey under ordinary circumstances such an enterprise would probably have been a foolish one but the political conditions in constantinople then were not ordinary there was no solidly established government in turkey at that time a political committee not exceeding forty members headed by talat enver and jemal controlled the central government but their authority throughout the empire was exceedingly tenuous as a matter of fact the whole ottoman state on that eighteenth day of march nineteen fifteen when the allied fleet abandoned the attack was on the brink of dissolution all over turkey ambitious chieftains had arisen who were momentarily expecting its fall and who were looking for the opportunity to seize their parts of the inheritance as previously described jemal had already organized practically an independent government in syria in smyrna rami bey the governor-general had often disregarded the authorities at the capital in adrianople haji adil one of the most courageous turks of the time was believed to be plotting to set up his own government arabia had already become practically an independent nation among the subject races the spirit of revolt was rapidly spreading the greeks and the armenians would also have welcomed an opportunity to strengthen the hands of the allies the existing financial and industrial conditions seemed to make revolution inevitable many farmers went on strike they had no seeds and would not accept them as a free gift from the government because they said as soon as their crops should be garnered the armies would immediately requisition them as for constantinople the populace there and the best elements among the turks far from opposing the arrival of the allied fleet would have welcomed it with joy the turks themselves were praying that the british and french would take their city for this would relieve them of the controlling gang emancipate them from the hated germans bring about peace and end their miseries no one understood this better than talat he was taking no chances on making an expeditious retreat in case the allied fleet appeared before the city for several months the turkish leaders had been casting envious glances at a minerva automobile that had been reposing in the belgian legation ever since turkey's declaration of war talat finally obtained possession of the coveted prize he had obtained somewhere another automobile which he had loaded with extra tires gasoline and all the other essentials of a protracted journey this was evidently intended to accompany the more pretentious machine as a kind of mothership talat stationed these automobiles on the asiatic side of the city with chauffeurs constantly at hand everything was prepared to leave for the interior of asia minor at a moment's notice but the great allied armada never returned to the attack about a week after this momentous defeat i happened to drop in at the german embassy wangenheim had a distinguished visitor whom he asked me to meet i went into his private office and there was von der goltz pasha recently returned from belgium where he had served as governor i must admit that meeting goltz thus informally i had difficulty in reconciling his personality with all the stories that were then coming out of belgium that morning this mild-mannered spectacled gentleman seemed sufficiently quiet and harmless 
nor did he look his age. He was then about seventy-four. His hair was only streaked with gray, and his face was almost unwrinkled. I should not have taken him for more than sixty-five. The austerity and brusqueness and ponderous dignity which are assumed by most highly placed Germans were not apparent. His voice was deep, musical, and pleasing, and his manners were altogether friendly and ingratiating. The only evidence of pomp in his bearing was his uniform. He was dressed as a field marshal, his chest blazing with decorations and gold braid. Von der Goltz explained and half apologized for his regalia by saying that he had just returned from an audience with the Sultan. He had come to Constantinople to present His Majesty a medal from the Kaiser, and was taking back to Berlin a similar mark of consideration from the Sultan to the Kaiser, besides an imperial present of ten thousand cigarettes. The three of us sat there for some time, drinking coffee, eating German cakes, and smoking German cigars. I did not do much of the talking, but the conversation of von der Goltz and Wangenheim seemed to me to shed much light upon the German mind, and especially on the trustworthiness of German military reports. The aspect of the Dardanelles fight that interested them most at that time was England's complete frankness in publishing her losses. That the British government should issue an official statement, saying that three ships had been sunk and that four others had been badly damaged, struck them as most remarkable. In this announcement I merely saw a manifestation of the usual British desire to make public the worst, the policy which we Americans also believe to be the best in war times. But no such obvious explanation could satisfy these wise and solemn Teutons. No, England had some deep purpose in telling the truth so unblushingly. What could it be? Es ist außerordentlich, it is extraordinary, said von der Goltz, referring to England's public acknowledgment of defeat. Es ist unerhört, it is unheard of, declared the equally astonished Wangenheim. These master diplomatists canvassed one explanation after another, and finally reached a conclusion that satisfied the higher strategy. England, they agreed, really had no enthusiasm for this attack, because, in the event of success, she would have to hand Constantinople over to Russia, something which England really did not intend to do. By publishing the losses, England showed Russia the enormous difficulties of the task. She had demonstrated, indeed, that the enterprise was impossible. After such losses, England intended Russia to understand that she had made a sincere attempt to gain this great prize of war, and expected her not to insist on further sacrifices. The sequel to this episode in the war came in the winter of 1915-1916. By this time Bulgaria had joined the Central Powers, Serbia had been overwhelmed, and the Germans had obtained a complete, unobstructed railroad line from Constantinople to Austria and Hungary. Huge Krupp guns now began to come over this line, all destined for the Dardanelles. Sixteen great batteries of the latest model were emplaced near the entrance, completely controlling, said Ulbar. The Germans lent the Turks five hundred million marks, much of which was spent defending this indispensable highway. The thinly fortified straits through which I passed in March 1915 is now as impregnably fortified as Heligoland. It is doubtful if all the fleets in the world could force the Dardanelles today. End of chapter 18《ハッピーバースデー》の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の時代の
that a naval attack by itself could not destroy the defences and open the road to constantinople and they had now adopted the alternative plan of dispatching large bodies of troops to be supported by the guns of their warships already many thousands of australians and new zealanders had entrenched themselves at the tip of the peninsula and the excitement that prevailed in constantinople was almost as great as that which had been caused by the appearance of the fleet two months before envert now informed me that the allied ships were bombarding in reckless fashion and ignoring the well-established international rule that such bombardments should be directed only against fortified places british and french shells he said were falling everywhere destroying unprotected muslim villages and killing hundreds of innocent non-combatants enver asked me to inform the allied governments that such activities must immediately cease he had decided to collect all the british and french citizens who were then living in constantinople take them down to the gallipoli peninsula and scatter them in muslim villages and towns the allied fleets would then be throwing their projectiles not only against peaceful and unprotected muslims but against their own countrymen it was enver's idea that this threat communicated by the american ambassador to the british and french governments would soon put an end to the atrocities of this kind i was given a few days respite to get the information to london and paris at that time about three thousand british and french citizens were living in constantinople the great majority belonged to the class known as the levantines nearly all had been born in turkey and in many cases their families had been domiciled in that country for two or more generations the retention of their european citizenship is almost their only contact with the nation from which they have sprung not uncommonly we meet in the larger cities of turkey men and women who are english by race and nationality but who speak no english french being the usual language of the levantine the great majority have never set foot in england or any other european country they have only one home and that is turkey the fact that the levantine usually retains citizenship in the nation of his origin was now apparently making him a fitting object for turkish vengeance besides these levantines a large number of english and french were then living in constantinople as teachers in the schools as missionaries and as important businessmen and merchants the ottoman government now proposed to assemble all these residents both those who were immediately and those who were remotely connected with great britain and france and to place them in exposed positions on the gallipoli peninsula as targets for the allied fleet naturally my first question when i received this startling information was whether the warships were really bombarding defenseless towns if they were murdering non-combatant men women and children in this reckless fashion such an act of reprisal as enver now proposed would probably have had some justification it seemed to me incredible however that the english and french could commit such barbarities i had already received many complaints of this kind from turkish officials which on investigation had turned out to be untrue only a little while before dr meyer the first assistant to suleiman newman the chief of the medical staff had notified me that the british fleet had bombarded a turkish hospital and killed a thousand invalids when i looked into the matter i found that the building had been but slightly damaged and only one man killed i now naturally suspected that this latest tale of allied barbarity rested on a similarly flimsy foundation i soon discovered indeed that this was the case the allied fleet was not bombarding muslim villages at all a number of british warships had been stationed in the gulf of saros an indentation of the aegean sea on the western side of the peninsula and from this vantage point they were throwing shells into the city of gallipoli all the bombarding of towns in which they were now engaging was limited to this one city in doing this the british navy was not violating the rules of civilized warfare 
for Gallipoli had long since been evacuated of its civilian population, and the Turks had established military headquarters in several of the houses, and had properly become the object of the Allied attack. I certainly knew of no rule of warfare which prohibited an attack upon a military headquarters. As to the stories of murdered civilians, men, women, and children, these proved to be gross exaggerations, as almost the entire civilian population had long since left, any casualties resulting from the bombardment must have been confined to the armed forces of the Empire. I now discussed the situation for some time with Mr. Ernest Whale, who was generally recognized as the leading French citizen in Constantinople, and with Mr. Hoffman Philip, the consulet of the embassy, and then decided that I would go immediately to the sublime port and protest to Enver. The councillor of ministers was sitting at the time, but Enver came out. His manner was more demonstrative than usual. As he described the attack of the British fleet, he became extremely angry. It was not the imperturbable Enver with whom I had become so familiar. "'These cowardly English!' he exclaimed. "'They tried for a long time to get through the Dardanelles, and we were too much for them. And see what kind of a revenge they are taking. Their ships sneak up into the outer bay, where our guns cannot reach them, and shoot over the hills at our little villages, killing harmless old men, women, and children, and bombarding our hospitals. Do you think we are going to let them do that? And what can we do? Our guns don't reach over the hills, so that we cannot meet them in battle. If we could, we would drive them off, just as we did at the Straits a month ago. We have no fleet to send to England, to bombard their unfortified towns as they are bombarding ours. So we have decided to move all the English and French we can find to Gallipoli. Let them kill their own people as well as ours. I told him that, granted that the circumstances were as he had stated them, he had grounds for indignation. But I called his attention to the fact that he was wrong, that he was accusing the Allies of crimes which they were not committing. This is about the most barbarous thing that you have ever contemplated, I said. The British have a perfect right to attack a military headquarters like Gallipoli. But my argument did not move Enver. I became convinced that he had not decided on this step as a reprisal to protect his own countrymen, but that he and his associates were blindly venting their rage. The fact that the Australians and New Zealanders had successfully effected a landing had aroused their most barbarous instincts. Enver referred to this landing in our talk, though he professed to regard it lightly, and said that he would soon push the French and English into the sea, I saw that it was causing him much concern. The Turk, as I have said before, is psychologically primitive. To answer the British landing at Gallipoli by murdering hundreds of helpless British who were in his power would strike him as perfectly logical. As a result of this talk I gained only a few concessions. Enver agreed to postpone the deportation until Thursday it was then Sunday, to exclude women and children from the order, and to take none of the British and French who were then connected with American institutions. "'All the rest will have to go,' was his final word. "'Moreover,' he added, "'we don't purpose to have the enemy submarines in the Marmara torpedo the transports we are sending to the Dardanelles. In the future we shall put a few Englishmen and Frenchmen on every ship we send down there, as a protection to our own soldiers. When I returned to our embassy, I found that the news of the proposed deportation had been published. The amazement and despair that immediately resulted were unparalleled, even in that city of constant sensations. Europeans, by living for many years in the Levant, seemed to acquire its emotions, particularly its susceptibility to fear and horror, and now, no longer having the protection of their embassies, these fears were intensified. A stream of frenzied people began to pour into the embassy. From their tears and cries one would have thought that they were immediately to be taken out and shot, and that there was any possibility of being saved seemed hardly to occur to them. Yet all the time they insisted that I should get individual exemptions. 
one could not go because he had a dependent family another had a sick child another was ill himself my ante-room was full of frantic mothers asking me to secure exemption for their sons and of wives who sought special treatment for their husbands they made all kinds of impossible suggestions i should resign my ambassadorship as a protest i should even threaten turkey with war by the united states they constantly besieged my wife who spent hours listening to their stories and comforting them in all this exciting mass there were many who faced the situation with more courage the day after my talk with enver bedri the prefect of police began to arrest some of the victims the next morning one of my callers made what would ordinarily have seemed to be an obvious suggestion this visitor was a german he told me that germany would suffer greatly in reputation if the turks carried out their plan the world would not possibly be convinced that germans had not devised the whole scheme he said that i should call upon the german and austrian ambassadors he was sure that they would support me in my pleas for decent treatment as i had made appeals to wangenheim several times before in behalf of foreigners without success i had hardly thought it worth while to ask his cooperation in this instance moreover the plan of using non-combatants as a protective screen in warfare was such a familiar german device that i was not at all sure that the german staff had not instigated the turks i decided however to adopt the advice of my german visitor and seek wangenheim's assistance i must admit that i did this as a forlorn hope but at least i thought it only fair to wangenheim to give him a chance to help i called upon him in the evening at ten o'clock and stayed with him until eleven i spent the larger part of this hour in a fruitless attempt to interest him in the plight of these non-combatants wangenheim said point-blank that he would not assist me it is perfectly proper he maintained for the turks to establish a concentration camp at gallipoli it is also proper for them to put non-combatant english and french on their transports and thus ensure them against attack as i made repeated attempts to argue the matter wangenheim would deftly shift the conversation to other topics according to my record of this talk written out at that time the german ambassador discussed almost every subject except the one upon which i had called this act of the turks will greatly injure germany i would begin do you know that the english soldiers at gaba tepe are without food and drink he would reply they made an attack to capture a well and were repulsed the english have taken their ships away so as to prevent their soldiers from retreating but about this gallipoli business i interrupted germans themselves here in constantinople have said that germany should stop it the allies landed forty five thousand men on the peninsula wangenheim answered and of these ten thousand were killed in a few days we shall attack the rest and destroy them when i attempted to approach the subject from another angle this master diplomatist would begin discussing romania and the possibility of obtaining ammunition by way of that country your secretary bryan he said has just issued a statement showing that it would be unneutral for the united states to refuse to sell ammunition to the allies so we have used this same argument with the romanians if it is unneutral not to sell ammunition it is certainly unneutral to refuse to transport it the humorous aspects of this argument appealed to wangenheim but i reminded him that i was there to discuss the lives of between two thousand and three thousand non-combatants as i touched upon this subject again wangenheim replied that the united states would not be acceptable to germany as a peacemaker now because we were so friendly to the entente he insisted on giving me all the details of recent german successes in the carpathians and the latest news on the italian situation we would rather fight italy than have her for our ally he said at another time all this would have greatly entertained me but not then it was quite apparent that wangenheim would not discuss the proposed deportation further than to say that the turks were justified 
His statement that it was planned to establish a concentration camp at Gallipoli unfolded his whole attitude. Up to this time the Turks had not established concentration camps for enemy aliens anywhere. I had earnestly advised them not to establish such camps thus far with success. On the other hand, the Germans were protesting that Turkey was too lenient and urging the establishment of such camps in the interior. Wangenheim's use of the words concentration camps in Gallipoli showed that the German view was at last prevailing, and that I was losing my battle for the foreigners. An internment camp is a distressing place under the most favorable circumstances, but who, except a German or a Turk, ever conceived of establishing one right in the field of battle? Let us suppose that the English and the French should assemble all their enemy aliens, march them to the front, and place them in a camp in no man's land, directly in the fire of both armies. That was precisely the kind of a concentration camp which the Turks and Germans now intended to establish for the resident aliens of Constantinople, for my talk with Wangenheim left no doubt in my mind that the Germans were parties to the plot. They feared that the land attack on the Dardanelles would succeed, just as they had feared that the naval attack would succeed, and they were prepared to use any weapon, even the lives of several thousand non-combatants, in their efforts to make it a failure. My talk with Wangenheim produced no results, so far as enlisting his support was concerned, but it stiffened my determination to defeat this enterprise. I also called upon Palavicini, the Austrian ambassador. He at once declared that the proposed deportation was inhuman. "'I will take up the matter with the Grand Vizier,' he said, "'and see if I can't stop it.' "'But you know that is perfectly useless,' I answered. "'The Grand Vizier has no power. He is only a figurehead. Only one man can stop this. That is Enver.' Palavicini had far finer sensibilities and a tenderer conscience than Wangenheim, and I had no doubt that he was entirely sincere in his desire to prevent this crime. But he was a diplomat of the old Austrian school. Nothing in his eyes was so important as diplomatic etiquette. As the representative of his emperor, propriety demanded that he should conduct all his negotiations with the Grand Vizier, who was also at that time Minister for Foreign Affairs. He never discussed state matters with Talat and Enver, Indeed, he had only limited official relations with these men, the real rulers of Turkey. And now the saving of three thousand lives was not, in Palavicini's eyes, any reason why he should disregard the traditional routine of diplomatic intercourse. "'I must go strictly according to the rules in this matter,' he said. And, in the goodness of his heart, he did speak to Said Halim. Following this example, Wangenheim also spoke to the Grand Vizier. In Wangenheim's case, however, the protest was merely intended for the official record. "'You may fool some people,' I told the German ambassador, "'but you know that speaking to the Grand Vizier in this matter is of about as much use as shouting in the air.' However, there was one member of the diplomatic corps who worked wholeheartedly in behalf of the threatened foreigners. This was Monsieur Kolochev, the Bulgarian minister. As soon as he heard of this latest Turco-German outrage, he immediately came to me with offers of assistance. He did not propose to waste his time by a protest to the Grand Vizier, but announced his intention of going immediately to the source of authority, Enver himself. Kolochev was an extremely important man at that particular time, for Bulgaria was then neutral, and both sides were angling for her support. Meanwhile, Bedri and his minions were busy arresting some of the doomed English and French. The deportation was arranged to take place Thursday morning. On Wednesday, the excitement reached the hysterical stage. It seemed as if the whole foreign population of Constantinople had gathered at the American embassy. Scores of weeping women and haggard men assembled in front and at the side of the building. More than three hundred gained personal access to my office, 
hanging desperately upon the ambassador and his staff. Many almost seemed to think that I personally held their fates in my hand. In their agony of spirit some even denounced me, insisting that I was not exerting all my powers in their behalf. Whenever I left my office and passed into the hall, I was almost mobbed by scores of terror-stricken and disheveled mothers and wives. The nervous tension was frightful. I seized the telephone, called up Enver, and demanded an interview. He replied that he would be happy to receive me on Thursday. By this time, however, the prisoners would already have been on their way to Gallipoli. No, I replied, I must see you this afternoon. Enver made all kinds of excuses. He was busy. He had appointments scheduled for the whole day. I presume you want to see me about the English and French, he said. If that is so, I can tell you now that it will be useless. Our minds are made up. Orders have been issued to the police to gather them all by tonight and to ship them down tomorrow morning. I still insisted that I must see him that afternoon, and he still attempted to dodge the interview. My time is all taken, he said. The Council of Ministers sits at four o'clock, and the meeting is to be a very important one. I can't absent myself. Emboldened by the thought of the crowds of women that were flooding the whole embassy, I decided on an altogether unprecedented move. I shall not be denied an interview, I replied. I shall come up to the cabinet room at four o'clock. If you refuse to receive me then, I shall insist on going into the council room and discussing the matter with the whole cabinet. I shall be interested to learn whether the Turkish cabinet will refuse to receive the American ambassador. It seemed to me that I could almost hear Enver gasp over the telephone. I presume few responsible ministers of any country had ever had such an astounding proposition made to them. "'If you will meet me at the sublime port at three-thirty, he answered, after a considerable pause, I shall arrange to see you. When I reached the sublime port, I was told that the Bulgarian minister was having a protracted conference with Enver. Naturally, I was willing to wait, for I knew what the two men were discussing. Presently Monsieur Kolochev came out. His face was tense and anxious, clearly revealing the ordeal through which he had just passed. "'It is perfectly hopeless,' he said to me. "'Nothing will move Enver. He is absolutely determined that this thing shall go through. I cannot wish you good luck, for you will have none.' The meeting which followed between Enver and myself was the most momentous I had had up to that time. We discussed the fate of the foreigners for nearly an hour. I found Enver in one of his most polite but most unyielding moods. He told me before I began that it was useless to talk, that the matter was a closed issue. But I insisted on telling him what a splendid impression Turkey's treatment of her enemies had made on the outside world. "'Your record in this matter is better than that of any other belligerent country,' I said. "'You have not put them into concentration camps. You have let them stay here and continue their ordinary business, just as before.' You have done this in spite of strong pressure to act otherwise. Why do you destroy all the good effect this has produced by now making such a fatal mistake as you propose? But Enver insisted that the Allied fleets were bombarding unfortified towns, killing women, children, and wounded men. We have warned them through you that they must not do this, he said, but they don't stop. This statement, of course, was not true, but I could not persuade Enver that he was wrong. He expressed great appreciation for all that I had done, and regretted for my sake that he could not accept my advice. I told him that the foreigners had suggested that I threaten to give up the care of British and French interests. "'Nothing would suit us better,' he quickly replied. The only difficulty we have with you is when you come around and bother us with English and French affairs. I asked him if I had ever given him any advice that had led them into trouble. He graciously replied that they had never yet made a mistake by following my suggestions. Very well, take my advice in this case, too, I replied. You will find later that you made no mistake by doing so, 
I tell you that it is my positive opinion that your cabinet is committing a terrible error by taking the step. But I have given orders to this effect, Enver answered. I cannot countermand them. If I did, my whole influence with the army would go. Once having given an order, I can never change it. My own wife asked me to have her servants exempted from military service, and I refused. The Grand Vizier asked exemption for his secretary, and I refused him, because I had given orders. I never revoke orders, and shall not do it in this case. If you can show me some way in which this order can be carried out, and your protégés still saved, I shall be glad to listen." I had already discovered one of the most conspicuous traits in the Turkish character, its tendency to compromise and to bargain. Enver's request for a suggestion now gave me an opportunity to play on this characteristic. "'All right,' I said. "'I think I can. I should think you could still carry out your orders without sending all the French and English residents down. If you would only send a few, you would still win your point. You could still maintain discipline in the army, and these few would be as strong a deterrent to the Allied fleet as sending all.' It seemed to me that Enver almost eagerly seized upon this suggestion as a way out of his dilemma. "'How many will you let me send?' he asked quickly. The moment he put this question, I knew that I had carried my point. "'I would suggest that you take twenty English and twenty French, forty in all.' "'Let me have fifty, he said. "'All right, we won't haggle over ten. I answered. "'But you must make another concession.' Let me pick out the fifty who are to go. This agreement had relieved the tension, and now the gracious side of Enver's nature began to show itself again. No, Mr. Ambassador, he replied, you have prevented me from making a mistake this afternoon. Now let me prevent you from making one. If you select the fifty men who are to go, you will simply make fifty enemies. I think too much of you to let you do that. I will prove to you that I am your real friend. Can't you make some other suggestion? Why not take the youngest? They can stand the fatigue best. That is fair, answered Enver. He said that Bedri, who was in the building at the moment, would select the victims. This caused me some uneasiness. I knew that Enver's modification of his order would displease Bedri, whose hatred of the foreigners had shown itself on many occasions and that the head of the police would do his best to find some way of evading it. So I asked Enver to send for Bedri and give him his new orders in my presence. Bedri came in, and, as I had suspected, he did not like the new arrangement at all. As soon as he heard that he was to take only fifty, and the youngest, he threw up his hands and began to walk up and down the room. "'No, no, this will never do,' he said. I don't want the youngest. I must have notables. But Enver stuck to the arrangement, and gave Bedri orders to take only the youngest men. It was quite apparent that Bedri needed humoring, so I asked him to ride with me to the American embassy, where we would have tea and arrange all the details. This invitation had an instantaneous effect which the American mind will have difficulty in comprehending. An American would regard it as nothing wonderful to be seen publicly riding with an ambassador, or to take tea at an embassy, but this is a distinction which never comes to a minor functionary such as a prefect of police in the Turkish capital. Possibly I lowered the dignity of my office in extending this invitation to Bedri. Pallavicini would probably have thought so, but it certainly paid for it made Bedri more pliable than he would otherwise have been. When we reached the embassy we found the crowds stiff there, awaiting the results of my intercession. When I told the besiegers that only fifty had to go, and these the youngest, they seemed momentarily stupefied. They could not understand it at first. They believed that I might obtain some modification of the order, but nothing like this. Then, as the truth dawned upon them, I found myself in the center of a crowd that had apparently gone momentarily insane, this time not from grief but from joy. Women, the tears streaming down their faces, 
insisted on throwing themselves on their knees, seizing both my hands and covering them with kisses. Mature men, despite my violent protestations, persisted in hugging me and kissing me on both cheeks. For several minutes I struggled with this crowd, embarrassed by its demonstrations of gratitude, but finally I succeeded in breaking away and secreting myself and Bedry in an inner room. "'Can't I have a few notables?' he asked. "'I'll give you just one,' I replied. "'Can't I have three? he asked. "'You can have all who are under fifty, I answered. But that did not satisfy him, as there was not a solitary person of distinction under that age limit. Bedry really had his eyes on Messrs. Whale, Ray, and Dr. Frew, but I had one notable up my sleeve whom I was willing to concede. Dr. Wigram, an Anglican clergyman, one of the most prominent men in the foreign colony, had pleaded with me, asking that he might be permitted to go with the hostages and furnish them much consolation as religion would give them. I knew that nothing would delight Dr. Wigram more than to be thrown as a sop to Bedry's passion for notables. "'Dr. Wigram is the only notable you can have,' I said to Bedry. So he accepted him as the best that he could do in that line. Mr. Hoffman Philip, the consulé of the American Embassy, now American minister to Columbia, had already expressed a desire to accompany the hostages so that he might minister to their comfort. This manifestation of a fine humanitarian spirit was nothing new in Mr. Philip. Although not in good health, he had returned to Constantinople after Turkey had entered the war, in order that he might assist me in the work of caring for the foreign residents. Through all that arduous period he constantly displayed that sympathy for the unfortunate, the sick, and the poor, which is innate in his character. Though it was somewhat irregular for a representative of the embassy to engage in such a hazardous enterprise as this one, Mr. Philip pleaded so earnestly that finally I reluctantly gave my consent. I also obtained permission from Mr. Arthur Rule of Colliers and Mr. Henry West Sidham of the Brooklyn Eagle to accompany the party. At the end Bedry had to have his little joke. Though the fifty were informed that the boat for Gallipoli would leave the next morning at six o'clock, he, with his police, visited their houses at midnight and routed them all out of bed. The crowd that assembled at the dock the next morning looked somewhat weather-beaten and worse for wear. Bedry was there, superintending the whole proceeding, and when he came up to me he good-naturedly reproached me again for letting him have only one notable. In the main he behaved very decently, though he could not refrain from telling the hostages that the British airplanes were dropping bombs on Gallipoli. Of the twenty-five Englishmen assembled there were only two who had been born in England, and of the twenty-five Frenchmen only two who had been born in France. They carried satchels containing food and other essentials, their assembled relatives had additional bundles, and Mrs. Morgenthau sent several large cases of food to the ship. The parting of these young men with their families was affecting, but they all stood it bravely. I returned to the embassy, somewhat wearied by the excitement of the last few days, and in no particularly gracious humor for the honor which now awaited me. For I had been there only a few minutes when His Excellency, the German ambassador, was announced. Wangenheim discussed commonplaces for a few minutes, and then approached the real object of his call. He asked me to telegraph to Washington that he had been helpful in getting the number of the Gallipoli hostages reduced to fifty. In view of the actual happenings, this request was so preposterous that I could scarcely maintain my composure. I had known that, in going through the form of speaking to the Grand Vizier, Wangenheim had been manufacturing his protest for future use, but I had not expected him to fall back upon it so soon. Well, said Wangenheim, at least telegraph your government that I didn't hetz the Turks in this matter. The German verb hetzen means about the same as the English sick, in the sense of inciting a dog. I was in no mood to give Wangenheim a clean bill of health, and told him so. In fact, 
I specifically reported to Washington that he had refused to help me. A day or two afterward, Wangenheim called me on the telephone and began to talk in an excited and angry tone. His government had wired him about my telegram to Washington. I told him that if he desired credit for assistance in matters of this kind, he should really exert himself and do something. The hostages had an uncomfortable time at Gallipoli. They were put into two wooden houses with no beds and no food except that which they had brought themselves. The days and nights were made wretched by the abundant vermin that is commonplace in Turkey. Had Mr. Philip not gone with them, they would have suffered seriously. After the unfortunates had been there for a few days, I began to work with Enver again to get them back. Sir Edward Gray, then British Secretary for Foreign Affairs, had requested our State Department to send me a message with the request that I present it to Enver and his fellow ministers. Its purport was that the British government would hold them personally responsible for any injury to the hostages. I presented this message to Enver on May 9th. I had seen Enver in many moods, but the unbridled rage which Sir Edward's admonition now caused was something entirely new. As I read the telegram, his face became livid, and he absolutely lost control of himself. The European polish which Enver had sedulously acquired dropped like a mask. I now saw him for what he really was, a savage, bloodthirsty Turk. "'They will not come back!' he shouted. I shall let them stay there until they rot. I would like to see those English touch me, he continued. I saw that the method which I had used with Enver, that of persuasion, was the only possible way of handling him. I tried to soothe the minister now, and after a while he quieted down. But don't ever threaten me again, he said. After spending a week at Gallipoli, the party returned. The Turks had moved their military headquarters from Gallipoli, and the English fleet, therefore, ceased to bombard it. All came back in good condition, and were welcomed home with great enthusiasm. End of chapter 19《ハッピーバースデーとは》Morgan Tau's story by Henry Morgan Tau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. More adventures of the foreign residents. The Gallipoli deportation gives some idea of my difficulties in attempting to fulfill my duty as the representative of Allied interests in the Ottoman Empire. Yet, despite these occasional outbursts of hatred, in the main the Turkish officials themselves behaved very well. They had promised me at the beginning that they would treat their alien enemies decently, and would permit them either to remain in Turkey and follow their accustomed occupations, or to leave the empire. They apparently believed that the world would judge them, after the war was over, not by the way they treated their own subject peoples, but by the way they treated the subjects of the enemy powers. The result was that a Frenchman, an Englishman, or an Italian enjoyed far greater security in Turkey than an Armenian, a Greek, or a Jew. Yet against this disposition to be decent, a persistent malevolent force was constantly manifesting itself. In a letter to the State Department I described the influence that was working against foreigners in Turkey. The German ambassador, I wrote on May 14, 1915, keeps pressing on the Turks the advisability both of repressive measures and of detaining as hostages the subjects of the belligerent powers. I have had to encounter the persistent opposition of my German colleague in endeavoring to obtain permission for the departure of the subjects of the nationalities under our protection. Now and then the Turkish officials would retaliate upon one of their enemy aliens, usually in reprisal for some injury or fancied injury, inflicted on their own subjects in enemy countries. Such acts gave rise to many exciting episodes, some tragical, some farcical, all illuminating in the light they shed upon Turkish character and upon Teutonic methods. One afternoon I was sitting with Talat discussing routine matters when his telephone rang. 
pour vous said the minister handing me the receiver it was one of my secretaries he told me that bedri had arrested sir edwin piers had thrown him into prison and had seized all his papers sir edwin was one of the best known british residents of constantinople for forty years he had practised law in the ottoman capital he had also written much for the press during that period and had published several books which had given him fame as an authority on oriental history and politics he was about eighty years old and of venerable and distinguished appearance when the war started i had exacted a special promise from talat and bedri that in no event should sir edwin piers and professor van milligan of robert college be disturbed this telephone message which i now received curiously enough in talat's presence seemed to indicate that this promise had been broken i now turned to talat and spoke in a manner that made no attempt to conceal my displeasure is this all your promises are worth i asked can't you find anything better to do than to molest such a respectable old man as sir edwin piers what has he ever done to you come come don't get excited rejoined talat he's only been in prison for a few hours and i will see that he is released he tried to get bedri on the wire but failed by this time i knew bedri well enough to understand his methods of operation when bedri really wished to be reached on the telephone he was the most accessible man in the world when his presence at the other end of the wire might prove embarrassing the most painstaking search could not reveal his whereabouts as bedri had given me his solemn promise that sir edwin should not be disturbed this was an occasion when the prefect of police preferred to keep himself inaccessible i shall stay in this room until you get bedri i now told talat the big turk took the situation good-humouredly we waited a considerable period but bedri succeeded in avoiding an encounter finally i called up one of my secretaries and told him to go out and hunt for the missing prefect tell bedri i said that i have talat under arrest in his own office and that i shall not let him leave it until he has been able to instruct bedri to release sir edwin piers talat was greatly enjoying the comedy of the situation he knew bedri's ways even better than i did and he was much interested in seeing whether i should succeed in finding him but in a few moments the telephone rang it was bedri i told talat to tell him that i was going to the prison in my own automobile to get sir edwin piers please don't let him do that replied bedri such an occurrence would make me personally ridiculous and destroy my influence very well i replied i shall wait until six fifteen if sir edwin is not restored to his family by that time i shall go to the police headquarters and get him as i returned to the embassy i stopped at the peer's residence and attempted to soothe lady piers and her daughter if your father is not here at six fifteen i told miss piers please let me know immediately promptly at that time my telephone rang it was miss piers who informed me that sir edwin had just reached home the next day sir edwin called at the embassy to thank me for my efforts in his behalf he told me that the german ambassador had also worked for his release this latter statement somewhat surprised me as i knew no one else had had a chance to make a move since everything transpired while i had been in talat's office half an hour afterward i met wangenheim himself he dropped in at mrs morgenthau's reception i referred to the peers case and asked him whether he had used any influence in obtaining his freedom my question astonished him greatly what he said i helped you to secure that man's release der alte gauner the old rascal why i was the man who had him arrested what have you got against him i asked in eighteen seventy six wangenheim replied that man was pro-russian and against turkey such are the long memories of the germans in eighteen seventy six sir edwin wrote several articles for the london daily news describing the bulgarian massacres at that time the reports of these fiendish atrocities were generally disbelieved 
and Sir Edwin's letters placed all the incontrovertible facts before the English-speaking peoples, and had much to do with the emancipation of Bulgaria from Turkish rule. This act of humanity and journalistic statesmanship had brought Sir Edwin much fame, and now, after forty years, Germany proposed to punish him by casting him into a Turkish prison. Again the Turks proved more considerate than their German allies, for they not only gave Sir Edwin his liberty and his papers, but permitted him to return to London. Bedri, however, was a little mortified at my successful intervention in this instance, and decided to even up the score. Next to Sir Edwin Piers, the most prominent English-speaking barrister in Constantinople, was Dr. Mitzi, a Maltese, seventy years old. The ruling powers had a grudge against him, for he was the proprietor of the Levant Herald, a paper which had published articles criticizing the Union and Progress Committee. On the very night of the Piers episode, Bedri went to Dr. Mitzi's house at eleven o'clock, routed the old gentleman out of bed, arrested him, and placed him on a train for Angora in Asia Minor. As a terrible epidemic of typhus was raging in Angora, this was not a desirable place of residence for a man of Dr. Mitzi's years. The next morning, when I heard of it for the first time, Dr. Mitzi was well on the way to his place of exile. "'This time I got ahead of you,' said Bedri, with a triumphant laugh. He was as good-natured about it and as pleased as a boy. At last he had put one over on the American ambassador, who had been unguardedly asleep in his bed when this old man had been railroaded to a fever camp in Asia Minor. But Bedri's success was not so complete after all. At my request, Talat had Dr. Mitzi sent to Konya instead of to Angora. There one of the American missionaries, Dr. Dodd, had a splendid hospital. He arranged that Dr. Mitzi could have a nice room in this building, and here he lived for several months with congenial associates, good food, a healthy atmosphere, all the books he wanted, and one thing without which he would have been utterly miserable, a piano. So I still thought that the honors between Bedri and myself were a little better than even. Early in January 1916, word was received that the English were maltreating Turkish war prisoners in Egypt. Soon afterward I received letters from two Australians, Commander Stoker and Lieutenant Fitzgerald, telling me that they had been confined for eleven days in a miserable, damp dungeon at the war office, with no companions, except a monstrous swarm of vermin. These two naval officers had come to Constantinople on one of that famous fleet of American-built submarines which had made the daring trip from England, dived under the mines in the Dardanelles, had arrived in the Marmara, where for several weeks they terrorized and dominated this inland sea, practically putting an end to all shipping. The particular submarine on which my correspondence arrived, the E-15, had been caught in the Dardanelles, and its crew and officers had been sent to the Turkish military prison at Afyum Karahisar in Asia Minor. When news of the alleged maltreatment of Turkish prisoners in Egypt was received, lots were drawn among these prisoners to see which two should be taken to Constantinople and imprisoned in reprisal. Stoker and Fitzgerald drew the unlucky numbers and had been lying in this terrible underground cell for eleven days. I immediately took the matter up with Enver, and suggested that a neutral doctor and officer examine the Turks in Egypt, and report on the truth of the stories. We promptly received word that the report was false, and that, as a matter of fact, the Turkish prisoners in English hands were receiving excellent treatment. About this time I called on Monsignor Dolci, the apostolic delegate to Turkey. He happened to refer to a Lieutenant Fitzgerald, who, he said, was then a prisoner of war at Afium Karahisar. I am much interested in him, said Monsignor Dolci, because he is engaged to the daughter of the British minister to the Vatican. I spoke to Enver about him, and he promised that he would receive special treatment. What is his first name? I asked. Geoffrey, He's receiving special treatment indeed, I answered, 
do you know that he is in a dungeon in constantinople this very moment naturally monsignor dolci was much disturbed but i reassured him saying that his protege would be released in a few days you see how shamefully you treat these young men i now said to enver you should do something to make amends all right what would you suggest stoker and fitzgerald were prisoners of war and according to the usual rule would have been sent back to the prison camp after being released from their dungeon i now proposed that enver should give them a vacation of eight days in constantinople he entered into the spirit of the occasion and the men were released they certainly presented a sorry sight they had spent twenty-five days in the dungeon with no chance to bathe or to shave with no change of linen or any of the decencies of life but mr philip took charge furnished them the necessaries and in a brief period we had before us two young and handsome british naval officers their eight days freedom turned out to be a triumphal procession notwithstanding that they were always accompanied by an english-speaking turkish officer monsignor dolci and the american embassy entertained them at dinner and they had a pleasant visit at the girls college when the time came to return to their prison camp the young men declared that they would be glad to spend another month in dungeons if they could have a corresponding period of freedom in the city when liberated in spite of all that has happened i shall always have one kindly recollection of enver for his treatment of fitzgerald i told the minister of war about the lieutenant's engagement don't you think he's been punished enough i asked why don't you let the boy go home and marry his sweetheart the proposition immediately appealed to enver's sentimental side i'll do it he replied if he will give me his word of honor not to fight against turkey any more fitzgerald naturally gave this promise and so his comparatively brief stay in the dungeon had the result of freeing him from imprisonment and restoring him to happiness as poor stoker had formed no romantic attachments that would have justified a similar plea in his case he had to go back to the prison in asia minor he did this however in a genuinely sporting spirit that was worthy of the best traditions of the british navy End of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of ambassador morgenthau's story by henry morgenthau this librivox recording is in the public domain bulgaria on the auction block the failure of the allied fleet at the dardanelles did not definitely settle the fate of constantinople naturally the turks and the germans felt immensely relieved when the fleet sailed away but they were by no means entirely easy in their minds the most direct road to the ancient capital still remained available to their enemies in early september nineteen fifteen one of the most influential germans in the city gave me a detailed explanation of the prevailing military situation he summed up the whole matter in the single phrase we cannot hold the dardanelles without the military support of bulgaria this meant of course that unless bulgaria aligned herself with turkey and the central empires the gallipoli expedition would succeed constantinople would fall the Turkish Empire would collapse, Russia would be re-established as an economic and military power, and the war, in a comparatively brief period, would terminate in a victory for the Entente. Not improbably, the real neutrality of Bulgaria would have had the same result. It is thus perhaps not too much to say that, in September and October of 1915, the Bulgarian government held the duration of the war in its hands. The fact is of such preeminent importance that I can hardly emphasize it too strongly. I suggest that my readers take down the map of a part of the world with which they are not very familiar, that of the Balkan states, as determined by the Treaty of Bucharest. All that remains of European Turkey is a small irregular area stretching about one hundred miles west of Constantinople. The nation whose land is contiguous to European Turkey is Bulgaria. The main railroad line to Western Europe starts at Constantinople and runs through Bulgaria by way of Adrianople, Philippopolis, and Sofia. <laughs> 
At that time Bulgaria could muster an army of five hundred thousand well-trained, completely organized troops. Should these once start marching toward Constantinople, there was practically nothing to bar their way. Turkey had a considerable army, it is true, but it was then finding plenty of employment repelling the Allied forces at the Dardanelles and the Russians in the Caucasus. With Bulgaria hostile, Turkey could obtain neither troops nor munitions from Germany. Turkey would have been completely isolated, and under the pounding of Bulgaria would have disappeared as a military force and as a European state in one very brief campaign. I wish to direct particular attention to this railroad, for it was, after all, the main strategic prize for which Germany was contending. After leaving Sofia, it crosses northeastern Serbia, the most important stations being at Nish and Belgrade. From the latter point it crosses the river Save, and later the river Danube, and thence pursues its course to Budapest and Vienna, and thence to Berlin. Practically all the military operations that took place in the Balkans in 1915 and 1916 had for their ultimate object the possession of this road. Once holding this line, Turkey and Germany would no longer be separated. Economically and militarily, they would become a unit. The Dardanelles, as I have described, was the link that connected Russia with her allies. With this passage closed, Russia's collapse rapidly followed. The valleys of the Morava and the Maritza, in which this railroad is laid, constituted for Turkey a kind of waterless Dardanelles. In her possession it gave her access to her allies. In the possession of her enemies the Ottoman Empire would go to pieces. Only the accession of Bulgaria to the Teutonic cause could give the Turks and Germans this advantage. As soon as Bulgaria entered, that section of the railroad extending to the Serbian frontier would at once become available. If Bulgaria joined the Central Powers as an active participant, the conquest of Serbia would inevitably follow, and this would give the link extending from Nish to Belgrade to the Teutonic Powers. Thus the Bulgarian alliance would make Constantinople a suburb of Berlin, place all the resources of the Krups at the disposal of the Turkish army, make inevitable the failure of the Allied attack on Gallipoli, and lay the foundation of that Oriental Empire, which had been for thirty years the mainspring of German policy. It is thus apparent what my German friend meant when, in early September, he said that, without Bulgaria we cannot hold the Dardanelles. Everybody sees this so clearly now that there is a prevalent belief that Germany had arranged this Bulgaria alliance before the outbreak of the war. On this point I have no definite knowledge. That the Bulgarian king and the Kaiser may have arranged this cooperation in advance is not unlikely. But we must not make the mistake of believing that this settled the matter, for the experience of the last few years shows us that treaties are not to be taken too seriously. Whether there was an understanding or not, I know that the Turkish officials and the Germans by no means regarded it as settled that Bulgaria would take their side. In their talks with me they constantly showed the utmost apprehension over the outcome, and at one time the fear was general that Bulgaria would take the side of the Entente. I had my first personal contact with the Bulgarian negotiations in the latter part of May, when I was informed that Monsieur Kolachev, the Bulgarian minister, had notified Robert College that the Bulgarian students could not remain until the end of the college year, but would have to return home by June 5th. The Constantinople College for Women had also received word that all the Bulgarian girls must return at the same time. Both these American institutions had many Bulgarian students, in most cases splendid representatives of their country. It is through these colleges, indeed, that the distant United States and Bulgaria had established such friendly relations but they had never had such an experience before. Everybody was discussing the meaning of this move. It seemed quite apparent. The chief topic of conversation at that time was Bulgaria. 
Would she enter the war? If so, on which side would she cast her fortunes? One day it was reported that she would join the Entente, the next day that she had decided to ally herself with the Central Powers. The prevailing belief was that she was actively bargaining with both sides and looking for the highest terms. Should Bulgaria go with the Entente, however, it would be undesirable to have any Bulgarian subjects marooned in Turkey. As the boys and girls in the American colleges usually came from important Bulgarian families, one of them was the daughter of General Ivanov, who led the Bulgarian armies in the Balkan Wars, the Bulgarian government might naturally have a particular interest in their safety. The conclusion reached by most people was that Bulgaria had decided to take the side of the Entente. The news rapidly spread throughout Constantinople. The Turks were particularly impressed. Dr. Patrick, president of Constantinople College for Women, arranged a hurried commencement for her Bulgarian students, which I attended. It was a sad occasion, more like a funeral than the festivity that usually took place. I found the Bulgarian girls almost immediately, most in a hysterical state. They all believed that war was coming, and that they were being bundled home merely to prevent them from falling into the clutches of the Turks. My sympathies were so aroused that we brought them down to the American embassy, where we all spent a delightful evening. After dinner the girls dried their eyes and entertained us by singing many of their beautiful Bulgarian songs, and what had started as a mournful day thus had a happy ending. Next morning the girls all left for Bulgaria. A few weeks afterward the Bulgarian minister told me that the government had summoned the students home merely for political effect. There was no immediate likelihood of war, he said, but Bulgaria wished Germany and Turkey to understand that there was still a chance that she might join the Entente. Bulgaria, as all of us suspected, was apparently on the auction block. The one fixed fact in the Bulgarian position was the determination to have Macedonia. Everything, said Kolachev, depended upon that. His conversations reflected the general Bulgarian view that Bulgaria had fairly won this territory in the First Balkan War, that the powers had unjustly permitted her to be deprived of it, that it was Bulgarian by race, language, and tradition, and that there could be no permanent peace in the Balkans until it was returned to its rightful possessors. But Bulgaria insisted on more than a promise to be redeemed after the war was over. She demanded immediate occupation. Once Macedonia were turned over to Bulgaria, she would join her forces to those of the Entente. There were two great prizes in the game then being played in the Balkans. One was Macedonia, which Bulgaria must have, and the other Constantinople, which Russia was determined to get. Bulgaria was entirely willing that Russia should have Constantinople, if she herself could obtain Macedonia. I was given to understand that the Bulgarian general staff had plans all completed for the capture of Constantinople, and that they had shown these plans to the Entente. Their program called for a Bulgarian army of about 300,000 men who would besiege Constantinople twenty-three days from the time the signal to start should be given. But promises of Macedonia would not suffice. The Bulgarians must have possession. Bulgaria recognized the difficulties of the Allied position. She did not believe that Serbia and Greece would voluntarily surrender Macedonia, nor did she believe that the Allies would dare to take this country away from them by force. In that event, she thought that there was a danger that Serbia might make a separate peace with the Central Powers. On the other hand, Bulgaria would object if Serbia received Bosnia and Herzegovina as compensation for the loss of Macedonia she felt that an enlarged Serbia would be a constant menace to her, and hence a future menace to peace in the Balkans. Thus the situation was extremely difficult and complicated. One of the best informed men in Turkey was Paul Weitz, the correspondent of the Frankfurter Zeitung. Weitz was more than a journalist. He had spent thirty years in Constantinople. He had the most intimate personal knowledge of Turkish affairs, and he was the confidant and adviser of the German embassy.
His duties there were actually semi-diplomatic. Weitz had really been one of the most successful agencies in the German penetration of Turkey. It was common talk that he knew every important man in the Turkish Empire, the best way to approach him, and his price. I had several talks with Weitz about Bulgaria during those critical August and early September days. He said many times that it was not at all certain that she would join her forces with Germany. Yet on September 7th, Weitz came to me with important news. The situation had changed overnight. Baron Neurath, the consulet of the German embassy at Constantinople, had gone to Sofia, and, as a result of his visit, an agreement had been signed that would make Bulgaria Germany's ally. Germany, said Weitz, had won over Bulgaria by doing something which the Entente had not been able and willing to do. It had secured her the possession at once of a piece of coveted territory. Serbia had refused to give Bulgaria immediate possession of Macedonia. Turkey, on the other hand, had now surrendered a piece of the Ottoman Empire. The amount of land in question, it is true, was apparently insignificant, yet it had great strategic advantages, and represented a genuine sacrifice by Turkey. The Maritza River, a few miles north of Enos, bends to the east, to the north, and then to the west again, creating a block of territory with an area of nearly a thousand square miles, including the important cities of Demotica, Kara Agach, and half of Adrianople. What makes this land particularly important is that it contains about fifty miles of the railroad which runs from Dediagach to Sofia. All this railroad, that is, except this fifty miles, is laid in Bulgarian territory. This short strip, extending through Turkey, cuts Bulgaria's communications with the Mediterranean. Naturally, Bulgaria yearned for this piece of land, and Turkey now handed it over to her. This session changed the whole Balkan situation, and it made Bulgaria an ally of Turkey and the Central Powers. Besides the railroad, Bulgaria obtained that part of Adrianople which lay west of the Maritza River. In addition, of course, Bulgaria was to receive Macedonia, as soon as that province could be occupied by Bulgaria and her allies. I vividly remember the exultation of Weitz when this agreement was signed. It's all settled, he told me. Bulgaria has decided to join us. It was all arranged last night at Sofia. The Turks also were greatly relieved. For the first time they saw the way out of their troubles. The Bulgarian arrangement, Enver told me, had taken a tremendous weight off their minds. We Turks are entitled to the credit, he said, of bringing Bulgaria in on the side of the Central Powers. She would never have come to our assistance if we hadn't given her that slice of land. By surrendering it immediately and not waiting till the end of the war, we showed our good faith. It was very hard for us to do it, of course, especially to give up part of the city of Adrianople, but it was well worth the price. We really surrendered this territory in exchange for Constantinople, for if Bulgaria had not come in on our side, we would have lost this city. Just think how enormously we have improved our position. We have had to keep more than 200,000 men at the Bulgarian frontier to protect us against any possible attack from that quarter. We can now transfer all these troops to the Gallipoli Peninsula, and thus make it absolutely impossible that the Allies' expedition can succeed. We are also greatly hampered at the Dardanelles by the lack of ammunition. But Bulgaria, Austria, and Germany are to make a joint attack on Serbia, and will completely control that country in a few weeks. So we shall have a direct railroad line from Constantinople into Austria and Germany, and can get all the war supplies which we need. With Bulgaria on our side, no attack can be made on Constantinople from the north. We have created an impregnable bulwark against Russia. I do not deny that the situation had caused us great anxiety. We were afraid that Greece and Bulgaria would join hands, and that would also bring in Romania. Then Turkey would have been lost, they would have had us between a pair of pincers. But now we have only one task before us, 
that is to drive the English and French at the Dardanelles into the sea. With all the soldiers and all the ammunition which we need, we shall do this in a very short time. We gave up a small area because we saw that that was the way to win the war. The outcome justified Enver's prophecies in almost every detail. Three months after Bulgaria accepted the Adrianople bribe, the Entente admitted defeat and withdrew its forces from the Dardanelles, and, with this withdrawal, Russia, which was the greatest potential source of strength to the Allied cause, and the country which, properly organized and supplied, might have brought the Allies a speedy triumph, disappeared as a vital factor in the war. When the British and French withdrew from Gallipoli, that action turned adrift this huge hulk of a country, to flounder into anarchy, dissolution, and ruin. The Germans celebrated this great triumph in a way that was characteristically Teutonic. In their minds, January 17, 1916, stands out as one of the big dates in the war. There was great rejoicing in Constantinople, for the first Balkan Express, or, as the Germans called it, the Balkanzug, was due to arrive that afternoon. The railroad station was decorated with flags and flowers, and the whole German and Austrian population of Constantinople, including the embassy staffs, assembled to welcome the incoming train. As it finally rolled into the station, Thousands of hawks went up from as many raucous throats. Since that January 17, 1916, the Balkanzug has run regularly from Berlin to Constantinople. The Germans believe that it is as permanent a feature of the new Germanic Empire as the line from Berlin to Hamburg. End of chapter 21